to the strength uh, of the crossing, which, as I say, will be fully investigated, but there is no cause for alarm. Thank you very much. That concludes topical questions. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13023 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on Scotland's future employability services. Could I invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes or so, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, today I want to set out how we propose to deliver employment services, uh, employment support services in Scotland that will better help uh, unemployed Scots into work, better meet the needs of our labour market and drive sustainable economic growth. And I, I want to commit to doing so uh, by working with this chamber, uh, with those who deliver employment support services uh, already in Scotland and crucially with those who rely on those services. Today marks the beginning of a process of engagement uh, within this chamber and beyond and a collaborative approach to de designing and delivering Scotland's future employability services that will put the needs of the unemployed at its centre. But first I want to say a few words of context on the Smith Commission recommendations on employment support and the challenge we faced in securing full and swift devolution of the powers and resources necessary to deliver these services uh, in Scotland. The Smith Commission was clear how it expected employment support to be devolved. All employment programmes currently contracted by DWP for the unemployed should be devolved on expiry of their current commercial arrangements. That was what Smith said. And this includes, but is not limited to contracts to deliver the work programme, which is of course the UK government's main employment programme for long-term unemployed, uh, and work choice, a voluntary specialist disability employment service. Smith also called for a new governance mechanism to be established which integrated the reserved functions of Job Centre Plus uh, in Scotland. But we've encountered obstacles to delivering progress on these recommendations. In January 2015, the UK Government published, uh, published its command paper proposing a draft legislative basis to implement Smith. It would limit our future support to those at risk of long-term unemployment and limits our services to be for a period of at least one year when Smith in no way indicated such restrictions should apply. It is also silent on how conditionality and sanctions might apply to any devolved employment support. And this is an area where we do want to explore the scope for a less penal approach than that currently applied. I've repeatedly pressed the UK government for clarification on this point with no response. The week after publication of the Smith outcomes, UK government took a decision to extend contracts on its programmes in Scotland. In the case of the work programme and work choice, contracts have now been extended until 2017. And this decision was made despite this government's express request that the contract extensions not be entered into. Decisions have... Yes, of course. Uh, Margaret McCulloch. Thank you. My understanding was that the... Westminster Government actually signed that agreement prior to Smith coming into force, is that correct? Uh, Minister? In the case of one of the programmes, uh, I, I believe it took place, if my memory serves me correct, in October. Uh, I think it was really a bit of an example of bad faith uh, uh, on the part of the Westminster Government. Of course. She said quite clearly the Gavin decision... The, I'm grateful to her for giving way. She said the decision was taken after Smith, but I've seen correspondence between her and the DWP that makes it very clear that the actual decision was taken in August by the UK government. Is that not correct? Minister? The contracts were extended after Smith, despite this government's express request that that not happen. And there is no way any Conservative in this chamber can argue that that is in keeping with the spirit of Smith. Now, decisions have also been taken to extend other programmes that we believe will with, uh, fall within the scope of the Smith Commission recommendations, such as, for example, mandatory work activity and specialist employment support. And we have still to see substantial progress on the fiscal framework Smith proposed. We do continue to press the UK government on these issues because their actions are undermining Smith's recommendations and fundamentally impact on the timescales for devolution. 
However, the UK Government decided before the general election to proceed with those contract extensions and deferred a response on revised legal clauses uh, we provided them until after the general election. And now these obstacles are frustrating. Uh, and the frustration is felt widely and, and, uh, and out beyond this chamber. But I'm determined to press ahead on how employment support can be devolved effectively and in a way that best meets the needs of Scotland. Now, the work programme is a pay-by-results, outcome-based approach. Arguably, it doesn't focus enough on the quality of services people need. Neither is it effective at helping those furthest from the labour market. Typically, the contractual costs to DWP of supporting the hardest to help is a fraction of the level of support provided to those closest to the labour market. This approach simply entrenches inequality rather than removes it. As at 31st December 2014, 22.8% of eligible referrals to the work programme in Scotland have achieved a job outcome, slightly above the 19.7% of eligible referrals across Britain. Again, as at 31st December 2014, of those completing the two-year DWP work programme across Scotland, approximately 69% were unemployed at the point of completion and returned to Job Centre Plus. That's hardly a resounding success rate. Performance of the work programme has been improving, but only for some, not for everyone. And I challenge anyone to say that 11% sustained job outcomes for those with the greatest barriers to work is acceptable. One work programme provider, not one of the Scottish ones, I must stress, was quoted in The Guardian on 28th of February as saying as follows, it's not about supporting 100 customers, it's about getting 50 of them into a job, the other 50 are collateral damage. At the end of the day, they, UK ministers, don't care about that other 50, it's an outcome contract, not a service contract. Now I cannot and will not accept that unemployed people are collateral damage. There are lessons to learn, both in terms of the effectiveness or otherwise of that programme, and how we can deliver an alternative and better offer in Scotland. Now, in comparison, work choice works somewhat better. Around a third of those entering work choice do enter work. It focuses on those furthest from employment, has a client-centred approach, and elements of third sector provision. All characteristics I uh, would expect to see uh, in our future approach. But with only a little over 9,100 starts to this programme since October 2010, it is clear that many disabled people in Scotland are simply not able to access this service. So we believe there is more we can do uh, and more that we must do. The devolution of these services gives us an opportunity to make real change. Working with a broad range of stakeholders, I propose to develop a more integrated approach to these programmes, which builds on the strengths of the current employability delivery landscape in Scotland. And this is our opportunity to develop a Scottish approach. It is our opportunity to develop employment support in partnership and in a systematic and holistic manner. It's our opportunity to develop employment support that reflects our core aims of sustainable economic growth, inclusion, fair work and social justice. And it's our opportunity to deliver an approach that can be less outcome focused and more client centred, have a range of provision including local and third sector provision, focus on those furthest from employment, reflect the needs of both unemployed Scots and employers in Scotland, build on our strong local delivery and specialised support, learn from good practice elsewhere, both domestic and international, and align with other services for public, sector, uh, public service efficiency, for example, for unemployed disabled people by linking to areas of health and social care. And our track record is good. We are targeting youth unemployment through programmes such as the Youth Employment Scotland Fund, Community Jobs Scotland, and our commitment through Opportunities for All, ensuring every 16 to 19 year old has an offer of training or education and making a real difference to the lives of many young people in Scotland. I believe, indeed. Gavin Brown. She mentioned the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. What percentage of those going through that programme are now in long-term employment? Minister, I can give you back the time you've had for you've taken for intervention. Sorry, I'm um, sorry, beg your pardon. I can give you back the time you've you taken. I can. Oh, you can. I can. Right. Um, I, I will endeavour to get that figure to uh, Gavin Brown uh, before the end of this debate. Uh, I, I don't have it in front of me right now, and he may shake his head. But if he 
asked me uh, before the debate, I would have been able to have the figure for him off the top of my head. I believe that through the devolution of powers to support disabled or unemployed people, Order, please, we Mr. can Chief. and will achieve more for those who have not benefited from current UK government schemes. Employability is embedded across a wide range of our policies in the health, justice and equalities portfolios uh, and beyond. With devolution, we can develop a distinctive approach to employment support in Scotland that builds on that broad approach and delivers our ambitions for fair work, social justice and sustainable economic growth. With the opportunity to focus on addressing barriers to employment for those who continue to be excluded from the labour market and our economic growth, such as disabled people, older workers, care leavers, individuals with caring responsibilities, ethnic minority groups, service veterans, those with convictions. There is an opportunity to consider a broader range of delivery models for devolved employment support, which draws on the expertise, experience and strength of partners across the private, public and third sector, with integration driving our approach. We have a well-developed framework for engagement on which we can deliver the Scottish approach through groupings like the Scottish Employability Forum, and the groups which support it. We can also draw on recent research through the SEF on how employability services uh, are being delivered in Scotland by the UK, Scottish and local government to establish a shared agenda with local and national partners to better join up services to deliver joint working through clarity of shared purpose and better target and align the estimated total of £660 million investment in employability support in Scotland. But that's across all uh, of those uh, different areas. We can build on that evidence base, drawing on the work of Skills Development Scotland and others, and develop our intelligence of the Scottish labour market, which reflects and meets the challenges and opportunities at sectoral and regional levels in Scotland. So there are key principles we must share and follow uh, that we will aim to design and deliver effective, sustainable and appropriate employment service in Scotland, which provides a seamless support to those on the journey into work, ensure a smooth transition of services so that essential support for those who need it most is available as soon as the existing contracts expire, not to simply replicate existing approaches, but to aim for an asset-based approach that compares with the best national and international practice, apply a robust, costed and evidence-based approach to our work, deliver through a consultative approach to policy development consistent with empowering of communities and individuals and shaping the public services they receive, build on our delivery strengths, including Skills Development Scotland as our national skills and training agency, and work closely with the UK Government and DWP to ensure an adequate transfer of knowledge and expertise and learn what they know and what we need to know from that. Yes. Richard she Simpson. may be going to mention it, but I just wonder if she would like to address the really serious problem in the modern apprenticeship programme in Scotland, which I will give figures in in my speech, but is substantially different uh, in terms of the application of those with disability, learning disability and other disabilities in Scotland. Minister. I wonder if she's going to mention that as part of the integration. Minister. There are, I, I, I would have to agree, there are distinct challenges in respect of disability employment in Scotland, uh, um, and that will be across uh, a variety of different sectors. We've certainly taken steps through Community Jobs Scotland to try and uh, uh, make sure that a slice of that money is targeted exactly on uh, disabled employment. Uh, and uh, uh, the SDS are uh, currently actively working to increase the uptake uh, of disabled individuals on the modern apprenticeship programme. Uh, and the, dis you know, the, the, the issue of disability is not just disabled. Uh, there are other minority groups that we have to work very hard with in terms of the modern apprenticeship programme. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, there would be no point pretending that that was not the case. Uh, it is the case. Now, there are some next steps. Shortly, I intend to set out details and timescales for a public consultation during the course of this year on the development and delivery of devolved employment support. Uh, that consultation will be delivered in line with the approach I've outlined today, uh, and also I hope we'll see the engagement and support of everyone in this chamber. Once our consultation is concluded, I will confirm the process for commissioning and implementing our new services. I will, of course, seek to bring my proposal back to this chamber for further input from members. As Scotland's economic strategy, I'm coming to a conclusion, if I could just maybe finish at this point. Scotland's economic strategy makes clear that tackling inequality and delivering economic growth 
are mutually compatible, not mutually exclusive. Our stakeholders have already expressed clear aspirations on how devolved employment support can be delivered differently and in a way which better reflects the needs of Scotland. That includes taking advantage of the opportunity to help more people into better work. That will benefit individuals, their families, their communities, as well as benefiting our economy. It includes seizing the opportunity to develop the employability services that will help deliver a socially just, equal and prosperous Scotland. Presiding officer, I commit today to work collaboratively while being bold and ambitious in meeting those ambitions. And in keeping with that commitment, I'm going to be generous and accept the Labour Party amendment. Much of it we agree with and indeed are already doing. The remainder will be the basis for a good discussion and who knows, perhaps even negotiation after the 7th of May. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Siobhan McMahon to speak to and move amendment 13023. Point one, ten minutes or so. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be taking part in the debate on future employability services in Scotland. It's timely that the Parliament is hosting a debate on employment on what is International Workers' Memorial Day. I will say more about this significant day later, as I want to begin with some remarks about the current employability model adopted by the Scottish Government and their partners. As members will know, the Strategic Skills Pipeline model is a recognised framework to support the effective delivery delivery of employment services. This work is mainly done through the Employability Learning Network, which is coordinated by the Scottish Government's employability team and is primarily delivered via the Employability in Scotland website. The website states that it provides a practical resource for all those involved in funding, planning and delivering employability services in Scotland. It has links to a number of useful resources, such as service guides, case studies, news items, events and workshops and policy and research. However, it seems to me that a lot of what is good about this initiative is out of reach of the most disadvantaged in our communities. This is something we have to change. Web is not always best. I understand that this website will be of great help to those organisations delivering programmes for those seeking employment opportunities, and this is to be commended. However, it should be more than a resource. The Employability Learning Network promotes prevention on its website. However, a lot of its content is about reaction. I would ask that the Government look at this aspect of the network's function in order that it reaches its full potential. The main problem with the current system, particularly the pipeline model, is that it isn't fluid and therefore those people who may have been out of the job market the longest or who have additional support needs, including mental or physical disabilities, are often let down before they even reach stage one. One of the key ways to start on this employability journey is self-referral. However, if you don't have the current skills to achieve this, particularly if you lack confidence as a result of being out of the job market, market long term, then you will find this hurdle harder to overcome. The Scottish Government's motion talks of the importance of effective and targeted employment support for individuals. I agree that this is key and that is why I support an initiative that help people take the first step on their employment journey. For many, especially those with a learning disability, they are eager to take their rightful place in the world of employment, but the current pipeline model is yet another barrier they face. That's why I support the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disability and the fantastic work they do developing the Project Search model. Project Search is an initiative that aims to bring a significant number of people with learning disabilities and autism into competitive employment. It does this by bringing together relevant organisations to work together effectively. At a time when many programmes are proposing pre-employment training, Project Search provides an 800-hour employer placement over an academic term, exposing the young person to a real workplace. Uniquely and key to the success of Project Search, the only positive outcome is a job. Students moving into training or further education are not counted as a success for Project Search. Currently, the employment rate within our country for those with a learning disability is 26%, but with programmes like this one I have just outlined, we can achieve a lot more. This would be part of the targeted individual support the Government have outlined in the motion, and I would be delighted if this suggestion would be taken up by the Government. The main programme that is used in Scotland for employment seems to be the Modern Apprenticeship Scheme. However, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has stated that the uptake of modern apprenticeships in Scotland is typified by significant gender segregation, with ethnic minorities and disabled people also appearing to have low levels of access to all forms of apprenticeships. Members will know that this is an issue that I have raised on numerous occasions, both in this chamber and during my time on the Equal Opportunities Committee. 
It is a sad fact that less than 0.5 per cent of all modern apprenticeship placements are taken by someone with a declared disability. This is an issue that the government have known about for a number of years now, and yet the figures aren't getting any better. In fact, the EHRC report states, Scottish government agencies are not paying sufficient attention to their leadership and that there is a danger the current practice reinforces rather than dismantles occupational segregation and the widespread exclusion of disabled people. I would therefore ask what action have the leadership taken to address this the significant problem? We will thank the member for taking an intervention. Will she accept that the government has committed uh, an additional £3 million to increasing access to modern apprenticeships for minority ethnic young people, for young people with disabilities, uh, and also by care leavers. And the EHRC welcomed this funding by saying that they were delighted that the government had matched the ambition of the Wood Commission report on resourcing needed to ensure that everyone, everyone in Scotland gets a chance to participate in skills development. Shvai McMahon, I will give you your time back. Thank you. Uh, of course I welcome the money. Um, I welcomed it at the time and I've welcomed it um, in this chamber. However, the problem is that it has taken so long. I mean, I've been in this parliament for four years and I have said that in every single part of the budget that it isn't getting any better. Um, so the money is welcome, but we could have been doing a lot more um, a lot sooner. Um, and that's the point that I'm making just now because it's not a huge problem to face the government, but it's a problem that I have has had a significant course of action to take and to address this. The government cannot come to the Chamber to discuss employment, employability services and be taken seriously if they cannot address such an inherent problem in their flagship policy. Therefore, Scottish Labour is calling for a review of all employability services currently helping disabled people find work in order that we can best utilise the further powers we will be receiving to this Parliament in a matter of weeks. The Tory-led government's failing work programme has seen less than one in ten of those in disability benefits helped into work, and the vital support offered through the Access to Work programme has failed to reach all who could benefit. That is why Labour will work with local authorities to deliver a new specialist work support programme to replace the work programme, which has helped fewer than one in ten disabled people who access it into work. As I said at the start of the debate, today is International Workers' Memorial Day. It is an atrocious fact that every year more people are killed at work than in wars. That is why this day serves to remember the dead, but fight for the living. I understand that this year's theme is removing exposure to hazardous substances in the workplace. I hope that those people who are taking part in today's commemor commemoration activities have a productive day. My thoughts and every best wish are with them. On Friday of last week, Scottish Labour launched our Workers' Manifesto. In that document, we committed to deliver legislation on culpable homicide, which will give families of victims a genuine possibility of justice through prosecutions. We also stated, and not for the first time, our commitment to review of the cases of convicted mine workers in the 1984-85 strike, and we committed to set up an inquiry that is transparent and public to examine the issues of blacklisting. For many in our communities, the fact that they have been blacklisted in the past is a further barrier to employment today. That is why it has to be part of any future strategy of employability services in Scotland. Work should be available for everyone, and there should be equal opportunities for all. In order to achieve social justice, our employment sector has to be open to everyone, regardless of their background, their ethnicity, sexuality, gender, religion or physical and mental abilities. Scottish Labour wants a Scotland where people earn a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. A Scotland that protects and provides for its workers. It is a fact that across the UK, average wages have fallen by £1,600 a year since 2010. That is why it is so important that we promote and utilise the living wage. Scottish Labour has stated that we will encourage employers to pay the living wage with make work pay contracts, which will see £1,000 rebate to companies who pay the living wage. We will also establish a living wage unit within the Scottish Government to promote the living wage in the private sector and extend payment of the living wage to public sector contract workers. For far too many, they go to work to provide for their families, but do not get the pay they deserve. We have to address this by making sure that those in work get the pay they deserve, a pay that provides for them and their families. Although the living wage is not a silver bullet, it does provide a decent day's pay for a decent day's work. Any future contract that delivers employability services in Scotland must commit to paying the living wage. We must utilise all our procurement legislation to make this a reality. It can be done and it should be done. The time for excuses has ended on this. The STUC estimate that more than 100,000 Scots are trapped on zero-hour contracts. As it currently stands, the Conservatives would rebrand the term zero-hour contracts, and the SNP Government would review them. 
This isn't near good enough. As the Chamber knows, we would ban them. This would mean that any job secured through any employability service here in Scotland would be just that, a job. Yep. James Dornan. Thank you. C can I just clarify then, when you say that you would ban zero-hour contracts, do you also include the zero-hour contracts that are taking place in Glasgow City Council? Do you follow me, man? Yes. Not a few hours here or there when it suits the employer, but a full-paid job that would guarantee payment each and every week. We need to utilise our people's please. skills and talents a lot more than we do now. As a member of the Education and Culture Committee, I have heard and read a lot of accounts with regards to the attainment gap as part of our current inquiry. It is vital that any future employment programme recognise the challenges the attainment gap is currently providing to our workforce. One aspect of addressing the current problem the employment sector is facing is to promote the labour-led initiative of the Future Fund. This would be used for those young people not in education, employment or training to deliver the skills and tools that will help them secure meaningful employment. We all know that we need to address the problems of attainment from an early age, but for those already through their education, we believe this would help their employment prospects. Today's debate about the future of employability services is an important one. It is important for all those people relying on such services to give them the help they deserve in achieving work and in return achieve a desirable income for that work. I have outlined in my speech the challenges that employability services currently face and the challenges those seeking work equally face. We have a duty to change this. That is why future employability services in Scotland have to have enough flexibility to achieve the desired aim for all in our society, but in particular for those facing additional barriers to the employment market. We also have to make sure that the jobs that people secure as a result of these services are fit for purpose and pay a decent wage for a decent day's work and that they don't use exploitative zero-hour contracts. We have a chance to change the way things have been done in the past when the new powers are delivered to this Parliament. I hope we can take this opportunity. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Gavin Brown. Seven minutes or so, please. Uh, Presenting officer, thank you. This is a critical debate. I think employability is something that all of us need to be mindful of and think about deeply. And it's something that the Finance Committee spent a lot of time over the last couple of years looking at through a formal review, through a number of debates and a number of separate inquiries. And I was struck by a quote from the Improvement Service when they were giving written evidence to the Finance Committee on the issue. And they said this, the bottom 20% in school at age 15 perform as if they have five years less schooling than the top 20%. So the bottom 20% performing as if they have five years less schooling than the top 20%. And the simple question then to ask is, what chance does somebody have if they have approximately five years less schooling at that stage when they then want to try and go out to the world of work? So it's critical that we look at what we're doing. We um, analyse carefully the results of what we're doing and make sure that we try to create sustainable employment for those furthest from the labour market. It creates the right outcomes for communities. It creates, obviously, the right outcomes for those involved. But if one were to look at it purely through the prism of the public finances, it also ensures that we get greater revenues and less pressure on public services. It's something that all of us ought to be thinking about and acting on over the short, medium and indeed the long term. So I want to share with the Chamber some of the conclusions of that committee report, some of the issues that I think are just as pertinent today as they were when that committee initially reported. And the first one is this, that we all need to take a longer term focus than we currently do. This government, the UK government and many governments across Europe obviously want to make the numbers look good and we focus on what are known as positive initial destinations, usually interpreted as six months. But what use is a positive initial destination if the long-term destination is just the ending of that employment after six months and somebody moving on to a different programme? It will take a brave government to put more of a focus on the longer term because the results by their very nature won't be quite as impressive. You won't have as great figures after, after six months. But until we focus on the long term, we could be putting people through different programmes that just repeat themselves and actually they're no better off afterwards. Secondly, presenting officer, the committee talked about the complexity of the landscape. I think somebody wishes, you wishes to give a yeah, of course. Margaret McCullough. Um, you're talking about the success of programmes for people that are long-term unemployed. The New Deal programme prior to the work programme had a much higher success rate 
yet the Conservative government actually did away with that and brought in the work programme. Can you tell me why that happened? I'm not sure I agree with the member. I mean, I read the uh, National Audit Office report yesterday, uh, which came out at the tail end of last year, which seemed to suggest that the work programme was marginally more successful uh, than indeed the New Deal programme at the time at which the report was written. Um, but it seemed to suggest also that the work programme was improving and was projected to improve in the coming years. So we, we, um, we should have to uh, agree to disagree on that particular point. The presenting officer talked about the complexity of the landscape. Um, now, part of this, of course, is due to there being different layers of government, but even within layers of government, it was pretty obvious to those who gave evidence from the third sector and indeed the private sector uh, that the landscape was too complex. And it would be interesting to know what progress has been made by the Scottish Government on that particular point. They set up a project known as the BASES project, Better Alignment of Scotland's Employability Services. It would be useful in closing uh, to hear from the Minister what progress has been made there. We heard complaints about the fact that for many of the third sector organisations involved in this, um, they still, even after years of discussion, only get single year funding. And it's almost impossible for those organisations to plan for the long term and for their clients who have complex and long term needs if they're only operating on a model of single year funding. funding. Uh, councils were criticised, the NHS was criticised too, and others, but it appears to me that while some progress may have been made, the majority of third sector organisations in the sphere are still operating on single year funding when most, other when most uh, government organisations uh, have a three or four year uh, funding mechanism in place. Uh, presiding officer, we need to develop a stronger evaluation culture. We need to look at the investment that is being made and establish what works and sometimes to be uh, straightforward, look at what doesn't work. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation a 20, in a 2010 study of all the initiatives in devolved nations said we are unable to conclude that there is unambiguous evidence that overall strategies composed of a variety of initiatives have worked. Now, of course, they may have uh, improved slightly since then, but I think the point still stands that in terms of evaluation, not just this government, but uh, governments more widely need to invest heavily in that so that we actually pour resources into programmes that we know work as opposed to those that don't. And perhaps the last substantive point made in that uh, committee report was that we need to get better, uh, all of us, at private sector engagement. Engage with them proactively at the point or before the point of shaping the programme instead of creating the programme and hoping that we can get them involved afterwards. Particularly true for SMEs, who in most cases don't have a dedicated employee who will look at all of the programmes, who will have this as part of their job, with the SMEs who represent a huge proportion of the workforce, a huge proportion of the potential, it's critical that we have a greater engagement with them. Presenting officer, my final minute, I just want to throw some questions back to the Scottish Government because Siobhan McMahon uh, raised a very fair point about apprenticeships for those with disabilities. The Inclusion Scotland briefing paper said that only 63 out of over 25,000 modern apprenticeships went to young disabled people. That is 0.2%. A briefing note from the Scottish Children's Services Coalition suggested that it was 8.7% in England. Now, I don't know if those figures are correct, but if they are, that should be a huge wake-up call to all of us, and in particular to those with direct responsibility. Why is it 8.7% in England, but 0.2%? In Scotland. And finally, in closing, presenting officer, just the question I posed to the Cabinet Secretary um, during her contribution. Um, the Youth Employment Scotland Fund was heralded as a landmark development by this government in 2012. It was the flagship policy of that year's budget. They said they were going to create 10,000 jobs for young people. And the simple question I wanted to know was how many jobs have been created and what percentage of those people going through the programme are still in work. It's critical we evaluate that. I was told that I should have asked this before the debate. The problem is, the question was asked before the debate. There was a PQ last year where Tavish Scott, I think it was, asked specifically, and he was told there was going to be a review and it would be published in early 2015. Mm -hmm. Deputy Presiding Officer, I think the early 2015 excuse has probably run out. I do hope the Scottish Government can give us some clear figures because they promised us 10,000 jobs. Let's hear what has actually happened before they start to judge the success of other governments' programmes. Better that they get their own 
House in order first. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Could I remind members who have perhaps intervened to check that the request to speak buttons are pressed? Um, I can give speeches of seven minutes to members, and I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK Government is uh, currently responsible through the DWP for employment services in the form of the Work Programme for the Long Term Unemployed and Work Choices for Disabled People. The contract with providers of the Work Programme is due to expire in May 2016 and Work Choice by October 2015. But despite many organisations making representation to the Smith Commission for devolution of these programmes, the UK Government extended the contracts to 2017. This would be understandable if the programmes were successful, but the National Audit Office in the report into the value for money aspects of the work programme dated July 2014 found that, in relation to the easier to help groups, this performance has not so far achieved the department's higher expectations and was approaching minimum performance levels. It was worse when they looked at the harder to help groups still below expectations and then highlighted that what this meant was that claimants on employment support allowance who had completed the programme had an 11 per cent success rate of employment, half the expected rate. Faced with this lack of success of helping the work programmes harder to help clients, the report found that providers' own estimates show that they plan to spend 54 per cent less on each participant and harder to help groups than when they bid. The report conclusion on value for money found that, contrary to the intentions of the work programme, contractors are spending less money on people in these groups and there are signs that some people receive very little support. The work programme is also not working as the department intended in the way it rewards contractors for performance. Flaws in contracts and performance measures have led to unnecessary and avoidable costs. Given these findings, it does not make sense that the UK Government, through the DWP, has extended the contracts to 2017. If we are to wait until 2017, then we must use the time effectively to design an integrated support package that helps people back into work and reflects the needs of unemployed Scots and Scottish employers. Submissions to the Smith Commission supported this approach. The Child Poverty Action Group highlighted the need for local solutions to unemployment. Devolution of the work programme potentially allows for programmes to be developed that are more suited to the local labour market, local skills and local employers minimising the imposition of arbitrary and inappropriate job-seeking tasks that can undermine claimants' current efforts to move into work and create unnecessary risk of benefit sanction. However, devolving the work programme without wider powers relating to social security benefits and operation of Job Centre Plus would limit the Scottish Parliament's ability to affect meaningful change. The Employment Related Services Association also favoured the devolution of Job, job Centre Plus. We would question whether it is feasible to conceive of a system whereby Job Centre Plus remains a Westminster government responsibility, whilst employment support schemes are devolved to Scotland. All parts of the employment support system need to work in tandem with clarity of, about the overall customer journey, responsibility for support at all stages, understood by all players, and with arrangements in place to allow systems to work effectively, including those related to data sharing. Any other arrangements risk a fragmented and expensive system insufficiently focused on moving people into work. And Capability Scotland outlined the need to include welfare benefits. A new work programme which genuinely addresses the barriers that disabled people who are found fit to work face in securing employment and provides tailored support is desperately needed. Yet if the Scottish Government itself introduced such an improvement scheme without also having power over welfare benefits, there is no guarantee 
that those participating in the scheme would be protected from having their benefits sanctioned by the DWP. The Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations submission stated that, importantly, it has often been emphasised that the devolution of powers cannot be merely administrative. In order to create the integrated, coherent, whole government approach we desire to help people into work, Scotland must have the power to both design and deliver employability services. Administrative power over the work programme would not support this ambition. One Parent Family Scotland saw the, approach for the opportunity for a more integrated approach with existing devolved responsibilities, stating the ability to design back-to-work support in partnership with current devolved spending budgets, such as health and education, would make services more joined up and with the capacity to be proactive. It is particularly important that workplace health, equality and decent employment are considered to be integral parts of back-to-work programmes, and these could be more effectively pursued with enhanced devolution. Presiding officer, the DWP programmes are failing Scotland, and the new incoming UK government should devolve all employment-related powers to Scotland in order that we can design a system that is fit for purpose and delivers for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Now call on Dr Richard Simpson to be followed by Chick Brodie. Officer, you, you will appreciate that if I concentrate on people with disability or health problems uh, as an area of expertise rather than straightforward employability, one in five of the Scottish population is disabled. That's around one million people. And although there has been a 10% improvement in employment since the Disability Discrimination Act, the gap is still 30%. As I understand it, there are three UK programmes in Scotland, the Work Programme, Work Choice and Access to Work. The Work Programme is not particularly relevant to disabled people. Only tiny numbers go into it. It doesn't really work for them. But Work Choice does have a much higher success rate at 45%, with Scotland outperforming the rest of the UK. And within that programme, the Individual Placement and Support Service, IPS, should be widely available through Work Choice, because IPS integrates employment support into community mental health teams, so that people can access health and employment in one place. The Centre for Mental Health reports that the IPS model can achieve a success rate of 60% compared to an average of 20% for other approaches. But in, in the last report that I read, 12 out of 59 Scottish constituencies, or around 20%, there was no one with mental health problems who found employment through the work programme and that was compared with just 10% of England's constituencies. And one of the themes I harp on about in this Parliament is we must look at variation. So I would ask the Minister to take a close look at those areas where this is clearly not working. The third programme is access to work. Now, this is a call centre-based uh, system and, and some real horror stories are emerging. It can take up to three months to get equipment and is only available for, for disabled people who actually have a job offer or her start date. Disability Agenda Scotland's principles and aims are fairness, respect, equality, dignity and autonomy uh, for those with disability and who could disagree with that. And DAS have 10 asks, two of which I think are relevant to this debate today. Uh, devolve and improve the access to work fully in parallel uh, with, to the devolution of the work programme and support people to prepare for access and stay in meaningful paid job by broadening the function of Job Centre Plus and employment programmes to include job readiness, but also to include retention. Uh, DAS has also called for a process with the work capability assessment for the employment support allowances to ensure that health and social barriers to employment are properly identified and information is shared with supported employment providers of choice. We do need a, 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 a revision of the current payment by numbers system of simply getting jobs. The minister alluded to that. Uh, so that as a minimum, in the case of those with dis disability and certainly more severe disability, there are payments to agencies by the level of preparedness for employment as a staging measure. On the draft 22 clause, the government uh, will need to work hard and fast with stakeholders. And I welcome much of what the minister said in creating a better system. 
um, and we will need additional funding for areas of unmet need, especially for those people with mental health problems, learning disabilities and autism spectrum disorders. We also need widening of its scope to provide an ongoing, uh, ongoing support for people at risk of falling out of the labour market. Really, it is all about equal, equalisation of opportunity for those with disability. Peter White recently broadcast in, on the In Touch programme on Radio 4, which I recommend as listening to anyone who's interested in those with, uh, with partial sight or blindness. And we had a, a graphic account of the difficulties faced by blind people due to ignorance and stigma facing those with blindness. We really need to work harder supporting employers to remove workplace barriers, helping them to understand the benefits of employing blind people. And the Alliance report, My Skills, My Strengths, My Works, uh, shows just how much of a problem this is in the disability uh, spectrum. Deputy Presiding Officer, the reduction in the full-time equivalent of disability special advisors by 30% since 2011 really does not sit well uh, with the UK government's intention of work for all. This should be worked, and I would ask the Conservative member to take that message back. I think it's also regrettable that one in four of all sanctions are against those with disabilities, uh, and we need more support for the help to work post-work programme. Now, the, the question of the apprenticeships have been addressed by two speakers already who slightly stolen my thunder on that. I had different figures. I had 79 out of 26,000. Whatever they are, the minister has accepted there's a problem there. We need to look at it very carefully. But can I ask as a start that we should collect data on the different types of disability in relation to the data because that is not being done at the present time. So that's not a, a hard first step. And if we can then understand the problem and look at exactly why there's this difference between 8.6% in England and 0.2% in Scotland, you know, we can maybe learn something from that. The, uh, the other area in which I think the Scottish Government can address is the European Social Fund, which is now running out. Uh, and uh, there are many smaller organisations who rely on ESF funding. Uh, and they're having to make staff redundant and cut provision for people with disabilities. This programme is only being delayed in Scotland. So, you know, we really need, to, again, the government need to look on that and make sure that, that funding is actually provided in time. The time has gone for organisations to have to have temporary redundancy notices issued to workers. Funding should be either continued by the government from a different fund until they can make a decision, or it must be made at least four months before the end. Can I conclude, presiding officer, by saying another area which needs to be addressed is getting offenders back into training and work. When I was minister, I introduced APEX to Balini, and I know that's been developed by uh, Rosanna Cunningham in her role previously as a justice minister, but we need to go further in that area. And I would also recommend that we should, uh, we should look at the 1974 Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. The Howard League has had very good debates on this issue, showing that actually the expunging of offences needs to be reviewed fairly quickly. I, I am finishing, but I would take an intervention if that's all right. Briefly, yes, Minister. I'm sorry. Uh, it was just to reassure uh, the member that these are issues that we are dealing with in the Community Jobs Scotland Fund. The, the money that was announced this year is quite uh, carefully categorised. Uh, and while it supports a thousand uh, jobs and they will be paid at living wage, it has to be said, uh, 300 of those jobs uh, were for vulnerable young people, for example, care leavers and ex-offenders. So we are looking quite carefully at that. And that's a very good program that does deliver exactly what it says on the tin. It isn't employer-led, which is the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. Dr. Simpson. In my last sentence was to say another group are looked after children where yes. there's a real problem uh, and that's another group. But can I thank the Minister for that and welcome the fact that they're supporting the Labour Amendment. Thank you very much. And to now call Chick Brodie to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Uh, thank the Scottish Government for bringing forward this debate. Now, I don't wish to rehearse all of the uh, Smith Commission statements on this, but it is worth repeating that the, it did state that the Scottish Parliament would have powers over support for unemployed people through the employment programmes, currently contracted by the DWP uh, uh, and, and through the work programme and work choice. Uh, and that would be done on expiry of the current commercial arrangements. Uh, the Scottish Par Parliament would have the power to decide how it operated these core employment support services. Uh, some would say that was a vow. 
UK ministers in the last few months of the last parliament, however, took the conscious decision to extend uh, the programme to 2017, despite that vow. In March 2015, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary will know, because she was there, uh, the Social Justice Secretary, uh, Alec Neil and, and herself, met with David Mundell to discuss the issue. Uh, in their statement following the meeting, they rightly called for the devolution of powers to build a more effective, targeted and fair, fairer employability system at the earliest opportunity to allow us to continue to build a focused, sustainable and economic growth programme. It's disappointing that despite the, that request, no action was taken before the dissolution of that parliament. Indeed, no cost assessment it was arrived at of existing uh, service, services. Uh, Presenting officer, to allow Scotland to deliver effective employment support, we need all job creation powers and employment uh, alignment powers in Scotland. It makes sense if, if all these powers are aligned, uh, controlled and prioritised by this Parliament in line with the economic strategy. The work programme, frankly, is a dodo. It's not alive to the employability or, the, or that economic strategy of which I'm, uh, I mentioned. And its life extension is meaningless and indeed some might say mischievous. Uh, it didn't even, the government didn't, that government didn't even uh, consider the Cambridge policy review which was to look at the resource implications for employ employability provision uh, across Scotland. Now we have set out the economic strategy and the vision uh, for Scotland and there are four key areas. Each of the four priority areas of Scotland's economic strategy, investment, innovation, inclusive growth, internationalisation, have a key role to improving the Scottish labour market and therefore the economy. Investment. Investment in, in, is key in people and in young people and includes the implementation uh, of the recommendations of uh, the Wood Report and providing 30,000 new modern apprenticeships across Scotland by 2020. Innovation, establishing a fair work convention to draw on best practice and facilitate a joint approach with partners. Inclusive growth, the Scottish Government would continue to lead by example, advancing greater merit-based gender equality, ensuring all staff uh, covered by Scottish Government pay policy will receive the living wage, which now is rapidly becoming the livable wage. And of course, the, the level of funded expansion of, of childcare from 475 to 600 hours per year will help those with young children participate uh, in the labour market. Intervention on this is critical. In internationalisation, the Global Scott network of over 600 business leaders, entrepreneurs and executives across 51 countries with a connection to Scotland provides Scotland with, in, uh, with invaluable insights and advice on doing business in particular markets and sectors. They're all initiatives that have the origins and plans in Scotland and further than that and supporting that we have here uh, the economic uh, employability uh, strategy the action for jobs supporting young Scots into work Scotland's youth employment strategy giving young people the chance to channel their talent enthusiasm and energy the opportunities for all and so on and, and indicates that to be successful we should have responsibility for all those programmes. And it's not just the Scottish Government that supports the devolution of work programmes in full. They take the SCVO, for example, who responded to the decision of the UK Government to extend uh, work programme contracts. They quote, we are utterly appalled by the UK Government's move to extend its work programme contracts when it was agreed by the Smith Commission that it would transfer to the Scottish Parliament as soon as current contracts expired. The fact is, it goes on, is that it's impossible to justify, to justify which, why such a broken and failing system would ever be continued. And still it goes on. While the work programme is expected to come with a heavy, ta heavy hefty price tag of three to five billion pounds, Community Jobs Scotland, which is delivered by the SCVO in partnership with the Scottish Government, has to date helped nearly 5,000 people into jobs at a cost of just 35 million pounds. He went on, all the evidence tells us that the work programme simply doesn't work. In fact, only 18% of people in the scheme actually get a job. We're completely dismayed by this delay in ridding Scotland of this exploitative 
punitive and underperforming program. And so we could go on about all the things that we, we, we have to do. But fundamentally, as in any business, as in any organisation, as in any association, alignment of a support service of employability to the end objective of economic growth, as we have in Scotland, is paramount. The strategic direction of one strategy, embracing Scottish agencies and programmes under the Scottish Employability Forum is the only way, the only way to allow us to grow our economy, to create sustainable jobs uh, above all, and above all, tackle the curse of inequality. Thank you. I call Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Stuart Maxwell. Can I refer members to my register of interests? Those of us who have got a background in employability will remember a well-known line from the Peter Hawkins book, The Art of Building Windmills. To be employed is to be at risk. To be employable is to be secure. This is a simplification, but there's a kernel of truth in what Peter Hawkins was saying. A worker on a zero-hours contract can be employed, but as we know, they're not necessarily secure. A worker on a casual or a temporary contract can be employed, but they are not necessarily secure. Even workers in high-value, well-skilled jobs can find that an economic shock, a dip in investor confidence, a spike in commodity prices or a corporate restructuring can deprive them of job security. Logically, workers and job seekers who are better skilled, better experienced and most able to adapt to changing labour market conditions are best able to secure employment and continue to receive an income. Yet the labour market is complex, people are different, our needs are not the same, society is unequal and the market sometimes defies logic and breaks orthodoxies. Opportunity and job security is not just about the sum of an individual's experience, skills and human capital. It can also be about the ambitions and obligations of an employer, the effectiveness of a trade union organisation in a workplace, the way in which labour markets are regulated, the performance of the economy as a whole and the performance of different sectors of the economy within it. The purpose of any progressive government's employability strategy should not be to meet the changing needs of a growing economy, but to ensure that we bring some security and some hope to those who are most at risk, least secure and furthest from the labour market. In doing so, I want to be clear that employability schemes cannot work in isolation. We cannot ignore the gap between the kind of economy we want and the kind of economy we have. We need a more holistic approach. We have to strengthen demand in our economy and we have to ensure that our employability programmes keep pace with the wider changes, changes in the labour market. We are seeing a recovery, but as the Labour Amendment suggests, the recovery isn't reaching everyone equally. As says, almost one in six of our young people are locked out of employment. And according to the Office of National Statistics, three million people across the United Kingdom were underemployed last year, working fewer hours than they wanted to and maybe even less than they needed to. We have to build a better economy on firmer foundations, ending the abuse of zero-hours contracts, making work pay with a higher minimum wage and a living wage, raising productivity and growing our key industries. We must reshape our economy so that it is rich with jobs and opportunities, not just for some, but for all. Full employment and fulfilling employment comes from promoting better employability hand in hand with a better, balanced, fairer, modern economy. I welcome the further devolution of powers to the Scottish Parliament by the Smith Commission, particularly the full devolution of training. In implementing the vow and putting this key element of the Smith Commission into practice, we can deliver a more joined up range of employability services here in Scotland, and we can find an alternative to the flawed and failing work programme. The SCVO have said that the immediate devolution of powers to support people into employment should be followed by wider debate on how employment and employability support should be shaped. I hope today's proceedings are part of that wider debate because people's futures depend on us getting this right. The SCVO have highlighted the need for a new programme which takes account of the distinctive Scottish labour market but they have also highlighted regional variations within the labour market too. 
I believe the client group currently served by the work programme would be better served with a new scheme, which is more integrated with devolved services, but it also has to be more flexible. We need national standards and we need a national framework, but there also must be a greater role for the councils and communities who understand their own local economies best. Presiding officer, I also want to say a few words about the apprenticeships. The Modern Apprenticeship Programme is a crucial, life-changing programme, and every young person who is qualified should have the chance to be part of it. But the truth is that training providers will struggle to maintain the standards and numbers we have come to expect from the programme, unless there is a fundamental rethink of funding rates. Contribution rates have, been made, have remained more or less static for 10 years, and under the new rates, some occupational errors will see cuts. I fear that some training providers might find that it is no longer economical for them to participate in the programme in the way they have done up to now. We cannot allow that to happen. Finally, President Officer, let me once again welcome the additional powers this Parliament is gaining to tackle unemployment and make those who are removed from the labour market more employable. We need a broader debate about how we put these powers to work for the people of Scotland alongside the power we already have so that we can reshape our economy and build a recovery for all. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Mark Macdonald. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. At the heart of the Scottish Government's work since 2007 has been the idea that to create a fairer, more equal and prosperous society, we must ensure that everyone receives the training and employment opportunities they require to succeed. This idea has been particularly relevant to our young people, and we have prioritised policies that help to equip our young people for work so that they can share the benefits of Scotland's economic success. Like the Cabinet Secretary, I am proud of what we have been able to achieve with the limited powers of the Scottish Parliament. It is absolutely vital that we build on this success and continue to reduce levels of youth unemployment and improve access to fair work. Our ability to tackle poverty, create social mobility and to improve our economy starts with providing the best possible support to individuals as they move from school and on into work. That is why the Scottish Government introduced Opportunities for All in April 2012 to ensure that all 16- to 19-year-olds not already in employment, education or training are offered an appropriate place in learning or training. By November 2013, Opportunities for All had already reduced the number of young people claiming job seekers' allowance by almost 30 per cent. And I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to a further reduction of 40 per cent by 2020 that will maintain our position as one of the European Union's best performing nations in terms of youth unemployment. We have also been successful in developing the Modern Apprenticeship Programme, which has offered support to almost 100,000 people over the last four years. Modern apprenticeships have played an important role in getting our young people into positive work destinations and to giving them the skills they need to pursue their chosen career paths. Now, I am sure other members will join with me in welcoming the Scottish Government's year-on-year -year commitment to increasing the number of new modern apprenticeships to 30,000 by 2020. Certainly. Margaret McCullough. Um, that the increase of to 30,000 new apprenticeships will actually then also reflect an increase in the actual funding that's committed to that and not just diluting the amount of funding that's already there for the 20,000 to stretch it out to the 30,000. I think that's an intervention you probably should have, made, you should have made to the Cabinet Secretary rather than a backbench MSP. But the point here is that when, you, when the Labour Party were in power, it was less than half of that, less than half of that number. The increases that we have seen over the last seven years have been extraordinary. The investment in the, in the modern apprenticeship scheme has been incredible. It has been a success, and it ill, behoves, it ill behoves members of the Labour Party to criticise a government that has got ambition for our young people when it did not do it. Uh, these programmes are just an example of the range of actions taken by the Scottish Government to improve employment opportunities, particularly for young people. It is in large part because of these measures that youth unemployment in Scotland is now at its lowest level since 2009. However, we must also ensure that when people do take up employment, they are paid a fair wage for a fair day's work. Adam Smith theorised that it is imperative for social progress to accompany economic progress and that our workers' wages should be at least sufficient to maintain them and their family. Yet many families in recent years have had their personal finances put under increasing pressure 
because of stagnating wages and Westminster's mismanagement of the economy. The Scottish Government has therefore led by example in paying the living wage to all staff covered by the public sector pay policy. Work undertaken by the Scottish Government in conjunction with the Poverty Alliance has also led to the creation of a living wage accreditation scheme for private companies. Over 100,000 employees are now covered by the scheme, with McKean Developments, a small business within my region in Barhead, being the 100th accredited company. The work undertaken by the Poverty Alliance in this regard has been vital to implementing the Scottish Government's strategy. Undoubtedly, the issue of employability is important for the future economic success of the country. And to ensure the success, we need to not only seek consensus with outside organisations, but also here in this chamber. For instance, in the submission to the Smith Commission, the Labour Party called for the work programme to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, and I welcome that. Margaret Curran, M Curran MP also echoed the SNP's submission in hoping that the work programme would be devolved immediately. And I was in agreement with her when she stated that Scotland has been failed by the work programme, with as few as 15 per cent of people on the programme in some parts of Scotland finding a job. I suspect that's the first and possibly the last time that I will quote Margaret Curran. But I'm sure Ms Curran's Labour colleagues in the chamber today will join with us in expressing disappointment that UK ministers have refused to cancel the renewal of the work programme contract in Scotland, resulting in the delay to the devolution of the programme to the Scottish Government until 2017. This delay is entirely contrary to the Smith Commission recommendations that the programme be devolved to Scotland as soon as the current contract expired. The UK Government has also failed to provide vital information about the programme that would enable the Scottish Government to move forward in redesigning how this service could work. Despite these unnecessary and unfortunate delays, the Scottish Government will press ahead with the redesign of the service in preparation for the devolution of it in 2017. Now, I am aware that one of the primary criticisms of Westminster's handling of the work programme was the lack of engagement between the UK Government and the relevant stakeholders. In light of this, it is important for the Scottish Government to ensure that stakeholders are adequately consulted in developing any future policy, so that a progr programme is created that genuinely delivers for its users. I am confident that the Scottish Government will take all the necessary steps to encourage an open and constructive dialogue with the relevant organisation in taking their plans forward. Presiding officer, in conclusion, the Education and Culture Committee has already discussed a number of issues relating to improving employability through the education system. Not only have we taken evidence on the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, we have also discussed the educational attainment gap and the role of employers on this issue. As other committee members are aware, examining the Scottish Government's role in reducing the educational attainment gap will take up a significant and important part of the committee's upcoming work programme. We all have a responsibility to ensure that this Parliament is providing the best possible support for people moving into work. And I am confident that by a collaborative and consensual approach, we can all deliver lasting benefits for the people of Scotland. Many thanks. And we have quite a bit of time in hand this afternoon, time for interventions and indeed invention. Uh, I now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Colin Beattie. Always dangerous to say that at the beginning of one of my contributions, presiding officer, but uh, I think most people uh, who undertake an objective analysis of Scotland's economy at present would recognise the progress that is being made. Um, employment increasing by 46,000 over the last year, uh, and at the same time unemployment falling by 14,000 uh, to a level 70,000 below its recession peak in 2010 and youth unemployment at its lowest level since 2009. And that last figure, I think, that last statistic, I think, is, is an important one because the Scottish Government, uniquely among the governments of these islands, took decisive action on youth employment by appointing uh, a minister with responsibility for youth employment. And I don't think that it would be uh, a stretch to look at the strong performance in Scotland in driving down youth unemployment uh, and the appointment of that government position to focus and channel efforts both within government and wider Scotland to tackle youth employment. But we recognise, and I think all of us in this chamber would recognise, that uh, the, while there has been progress and while that progress is welcome, work still remains to be done and we cannot rest on our laurels in that respect. And I think that both the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister uh, have shown in the work that they've done since taking up office that that is certainly the position that they take. I note the briefing that we received from SCVO, 
which spoke about the work that the third sector is providing uh, in terms of supporting in terms of employability support across Scotland through successful programmes uh, and they say that they believe the sector has the drive the vision and the ability to create a supportive empowering environment supporting people making their journey back into work or into their first job and I think that um, what I would like to do is, is explore a couple of examples, local examples from within my constituency, which I think demonstrate strong work by um, third sector organisations, which perhaps are uh, an example of good practice that could be looked at uh, as, as models to be looked at elsewhere within Scotland. The first, uh, and, I, and I believe the Minister has visited them, is a Station House Media Unit, or SHMU, uh, who are based in Woodside in my constituency. Um, SHMU offer a variety of different things from community radio and publications uh, through to their um, what's called SHMU train, um, which sounds like an innovative transportation method, but is actually um, their uh, programme of uh, delivering training and employability services to young people within uh, hard to reach communities. And they do that um, via the, uh, their accredited SQA centre um, and they've been delivering the employability awards since October 2012. Uh, and they expect in the near future to be delivering um, uh, qualification awards in radio music and film. But they have two specific programmes which they operate through the Shmoo Train initiative. Uh, the first of those uh, is early interventions, which is for those in school who are identified as being in high risk of not securing a positive destination on leaving school. And the other is positive transitions, which is a 12-week training course supporting 16 to 19-year-olds to overcome barriers, develop core skills, identify opportunities and progress to a positive destination of either employment, education or training. Now, the positive transitions programme targets and engages young people between age 14 to 16 within school who exhibit early identifiers such as learning difficulties, lower literacy and numeracy skills, uh, numeracy skills lack of confidence and intermittent attendance. Um, they uh, engage these young people uh, and, and encourage their re-engagement by providing motivating and appealing opportunities to build on their interests uh, and challenge themselves because many of those individuals who, who would be struggling at that stage are perhaps those who, who do not demonstrate either a desire or an aptitude for some of the more academic uh, subjects within the curriculum. And uh, the work that SHMU does channels the, the interests of those individuals to ensure that they uh, can fulfil their potential. Um, pre uh, the last figures that I've seen uh, is that um, the, of the participants that have taken part, uh, an 82.5 per cent success rate has been achieved in getting them to go on to a positive destination. Uh, and they have a, a programme within Northfield Academy in my constituency, um, which has enabled uh, young people to, for example, work on uh, a project in conjunction with Shmoo Press, which is another element uh, offered by Shmoo, producing a youth page for the Coming North Community magazine, which goes out in the Cummings Park area of my constituency. Positive transitions, um, presiding officer, uh, Take, participants take part in weekly employability sessions, working on CV writing, interview presentation and job search skills. Um, the, uh, the course uh, encourages uh, them to focus on issues such as attendance and timekeeping, confidence, communication skills, personal presentation, appropriate language and behaviour uh, are all monitored and addressed during, during that course. And the aim is to have young people job ready so that they can sustain employment, not just gain, but sustain employment within the labour market following completion of the course. And the uh, success rate uh, over the period 2009-12 that I have figures for was a success rate of 72.5%. And having met with uh, a number of the individuals at, uh, at graduation uh, during the, the, the Positive Transitions programme, uh, I'm always struck by the difference when you see the videos that they recorded at the beginning of the process and the young people who are there uh, graduating from the process at the end. I want to also talk very briefly about Pathways, um, which is <coughs> a charity formed in 1998 and based in uh, Manor in my constituency, which um, delivers uh, support to people to encourage participation in lifelong learning and promote positive mental health by removing barriers to employment. Um, 
Since they began, they have helped over 1,100 people find work, supported 700 people through counselling and provided adult learning classes to over 1,000 people. Um, they receive support from a mixture of sources and uh, what they seek to do is assist service users to secure a job or training that is right for them, assist with CV development, interview preparation, application form completion uh, and ensure that those people again are able to make that transition into the workplace. And one final area that I'd like to focus on, presiding officer, and you did say I had a bit of time in hand, uh, is around uh, autism, which, as people will know, is a very strong interest of mine. And I think something that needs to be done uh, in, in relation to supporting individuals with autism, but also supporting employers. And I think that one of the things we have to focus on, as well as the employability support for the individual, is support for employers to make the necessary alterations or, or changes to the workplace environment that can enable particularly individuals on the autistic spectrum not just to gain but to sustain employment. There are a number of individuals on the autistic spectrum who would be a great asset to any workforce. Um, they have a range of skills and aptitudes which employers can take advantage of. And also one of the things which uh, can be looked at is that often jobs which could be considered to be boring or repetitive to many people and can often be very difficult to fill and to keep filled can be jobs which individuals on the autistic spectrum can fill uh, and actually enjoy partaking of. Uh, lastly, very lastly, uh, honestly, lastly, presiding officer, uh, in terms of interviews, um, interviews are often difficult for individuals on the autistic spectrum. Maintaining of eye contact is uh, often a challenge uh, and they can often come across as nervous and underprepared. Uh, support for those individuals needs to be put in place, but also support for employers so they recognise the difficulties that may be faced. And for example, one, uh, uh, one thing which I've seen recently at the Young Scotland's Got Talent event was the My Video CV app, which had been uh, created through Values into Action Scotland, um, which allows to individuals close, to record a CV, uh, which offers the opportunity for the employer to see that individual and understand their skills. These are things which I think we should be promoting more widely and would be of great benefit. Thanks so much. And I now call on Colin Beattie to be followed by Elaine Murray. Presiding Officer, employability in Scotland, much as in any country, is a crucial indicator of the strength of the economy and is also one of the key components in eradicating poverty and ensuring quality throughout our society. We know that unemployment in young people can have tremendously damaging long-term effects from a financial perspective, someone who is unemployed at a young age is more likely to suffer low wages and further unemployment in their career. And this is not to speak of personal issues that are likely to arise, including poorer health, lower job satisfaction and greater susceptibility to depression. When combined, these negative effects are liable to make it very difficult for someone to find sustainable employment. The Scottish Government's youth employment strategy is quite clearly a range of practicable, focused and sensible measures that will provide the necessary steps for Scotland's young people to join the employment market. The global financial crisis in 2008 set employment opportunities back drastically, but the Government's response is bearing fruit. As the Cabinet Secretary set out in the document entitled Developing the Young Workforce Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy, the ambition is to improve youth employment levels from beyond where they were before 2008 and to reduce 2014 levels of youth unemployment by 40% in the next six years. And this can be done through a range of steps. The report by the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce concluded that we need to fundamentally examine how a range of learning that leads to a wide variety of jobs can be provided, promoted and valued. At the most basic level, employment opportunities have to begin with an educational experience that is voc vocationally relevant and focused. In order to achieve this, we must seek the input of employers and councils alike. When we examine the situation, we can see that some of the groups in our society clearly suffer from a greater lack of employment opportunities than others. Four out of every ten young people who attain qualifications at SEQF level three or below become unemployed upon leaving school. Young people from our minority communities comprise only 2% of all modern apprenticeship entrants, despite these communities representing 6% of all young people. By the time young people with a declared or assessed disability reach the age of 26, they are four times as likely to be unemployed as their non-disabled peers. One in three looked after children will be unemployed nine months after leaving school. We really must look after them better. 
It is obvious that the Scottish Government's work policy needs to ensure parity for all to end this inequality, and if we engage with councils and employers, we can find the means. The Government's work with employers is already beginning to pay dividends. Many employers are now encouraged to work towards the Investors and Young People Award following its recent launch. Rob Woodward, the Chief Executive of ITV, is chairing the National Invest in Young People Group, which has been tasked with the implementation of regional Invest in Young People Groups. Now, these local groups will create a bridge between employers and education, supporting employers and employing young people, while providing a resource for teachers and practitioners. The first regional Invest in Young People Group was launched in Glasgow in February and includes representatives from Scottish Water, NHS Greater Glasgow and the Clyde and Weir Group. And I look forward to seeing this initiative spread through the rest of the country and in particular my constituency of Midlothian, North and Musselburgh. In fact, the positive steps the Scottish Government is taking are already beginning to show positive results in my constituency. The most recent Skills Development Scotland update for Midlothian includes some examples of this. And looking at some of the statistics taken from April to September 2014, in Midlothian, SDS funded 223 modern apprenticeship starts, while there were 625 modern apprentices in training. SDS provided over 3,100 career information and guidance engagements to over 1,600 people in this period, and also funded 128 people through the Employability Fund, helping to support their pathway into work. And the figures for East Lothian are no less impressive. Over the same period, 240 modern apprenticeship starts were funded, resulting in 639 modern apprentices in training. Almost 3,000 career information and guidance engagements were provided to over 1,700 people, and SDS funded 120 people through the Employability Fund over these months. Of course, this is just a snapshot of where we are at present. There's much more work to be done if we are to hit our target of reducing youth unemployment by 40% by 2021. The Government's roadmap clearly lays out the steps which will be taken in the coming years to reach this ambitious but achievable target. For young people, we'll be taking the approach of ensuring they have as much information as possible about the opportunities provided by the Developing the Young Workforce programme. And this approach will ensure that Scotland's young people are aware of the possibilities available to them going forward from school, and thus they can maximise their potential. By the second year of the programme, it's expected that there, there will be more opportunities in place for young people to undertake learning that connects directly to employment by means such as school, college, partnerships, and by the third year, more schools will be developing a broader range of qualifications in partnership with colleges and other providers, and there will be more partnerships between employers and schools to inform curriculum design and delivery, and to provide work-related learning experiences. By the seventh year of the programme, we should see enhanced employer satisfaction, more young people completing vocational qualifications and achieving qualifications at a higher level, and ultimately, more young people across Scotland progressing from secondary schools to college, training, university and employment. We'll also work with employers to expand work-based learning via the Modern Apprenticeship Scheme. And such apprenticeships are one of the most fundamental ways of providing work-based skills, experience and a qualification while in employment. By year seven of the programme, there will be at least 30,000 new Modern Apprenticeship starts each year, while the Invest in Young People's Groups will be firmly established, resulting in significantly increased levels of sustained employment among young people. In conclusion, the Scottish Government has a clear commitment to fairness, equality and social justice, and we can help achieve this by working with employers, local authorities and the education sector to give the next generation the tools they need to get a head start on their working lives, by ensuring that no one is left out. For example, by the introduction of this year's Equalities Pilot Action that creates new opportunities for those from currently underrepresented groups, or next year's publication of the Scottish Funding Council's plan to reduce gender imbalances on courses, and the necessary steps are being taken to safeguard the futures of all Scotland's young people. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on Dr Elaine Murray to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to take part in this debate and to take this opportunity to highlight some of the issues faced in my region in Dumfries and Galloway around employment and employability and some of the approaches which are being developed uh, in order to address them because I think there are examples there of good practice uh, and also they think they demonstrate the importance of local flexibility 
uh, in service delivery. In advance of developing its new economic strategy, Dumfries and Galloway Council commissioned the Creighton Institute, a collaborative venture between the Creighton campus, academic institutions and their wider partners in the business, local government, health and voluntary sectors to carry out a baseline study of the local economy. Now, the findings of this research were not a great surprise to those of us who live in the region, but they are worth repeating, as I think they indicate the scale of the issues our region faces in both growing the economy and in tackling uh, unemployment and underemployment, which is a problem in the region too. As in many rural areas, the overall economic productivity of Dumfries and Galloway is relatively low. The gross value added per hour worked is just 82% of the Scottish average. The workforce is less well qualified than the Scottish average. 20% of the population are educated to degree level compared to 30% across Scotland. And the proportion of people of working age with no qualifications is 12%, whereas the national average is 6%. Sure. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I, I wonder if the member is perhaps not looking at the benefits of uh, the kind of structure she has in her constituency, as I do in parts of mine, in that we can't simply measure contribution by pounds and pence. If we've got an older population, then people will be supporting that older population. That will have an economic benefit, but more fundamentally, we're supporting society and the people in it. So I would suggest that the member might, like me, not wish to measure things simply by economic measures alone. Well, these are, I, I'd have to say to the member, these are not actually my measurements. This is the research produced by the Crichton Institute as a baseline, so uh, what they were telling us. Uh, they also said there is an evidence of underemployment increasing in the region. Ten years ago, 75% of those people uh, in work, work in Dumfries and Galloway were in full-time employment, but that's now fallen to two-thirds, and that's people of working age, I should say. Uh, on top of that, Dumfries and Galloway has the lowest wage economy in Scotland. Average er earnings are 15% lower than the Scottish average, with average weekly earnings now at £342 per week. Now, that's a particular challenge in a rural area because of the higher costs of transport and other services. The Centre for Research and Social Policy found that a family with two children living in a small town in South Scotland actually require an income 25% higher than they would in a comparable urban area to enjoy the same standard of living and added to that, youth unemployment in Dumfries and Gallery is consistently above the Scottish and UK averages. So all these factors add up to a significant challenge to develop a more resilient, diverse, inclusive and better connected local economy to provide better paid, higher skilled full-time employment and to increase the skills level of the local workforce so that they can benefit from economic growth in the region. Tackling low pay also has to be a priority, whether arising from zero hour contracts or from poor rates of pay. Several initiatives are being developed to address these issues. 3.5 million over the next five years, a combination of the council funding and European grants, will fund the council's economic inclusion pro uh, programme, the centre of which will be a youth guarantee for Dumfries and Galloway. This will guarantee every young person leaving school or becoming unemployed a place in employment, continued education and apprenticeship or traineeship within four months of leaving education or employment. The Young Entrepreneurs Scheme, which helps young people set up businesses, is to be expanded to include a programme of aftercare to help those businesses survive and grow. Dumfries and Galloway Total Access Point, known by the acronym TAP, is to be expanded to support more local businesses. TAP is a partnership between Dumfries and Galloway Council, the Department of Work and Pensions, Skills Development Scotland and the local colleges, which provides a single point of contact to support the recruitment needs of local businesses. It was developed after listening to the needs of businesses, particularly small and micro businesses, as 90% of the almost 6,000 businesses in the region have a workforce of 10 or fewer. The Local Employability Partnership, also involving the Council, the local colleges, the third sector, Skills Development Scotland, the Prince's Trust and Job Centre Plus, uh, provides a range of employability services across the region. This support includes one-to-one -one support to assist people wanting to get back into work or training. Locally built based link work workers provide confidential advice and support, examining the barriers which can prevent people achieving empl the employment they desire and how those barriers can be overcome. And that obviously, where people have disabilities and so on, that type of support can be particularly helpful. A team of employability link workers is dedicated to supporting young people aged 16 to 18, helping develop their skills, providing access to a range of tailored activities. That could be addressing numeracy and literacy needs, uh, possibly writing a CV, but also helping people to identify the strengths that they have got to offer an employer. 
Scottish Labour's proposals for a futures fund of 1,600 people for all 18 and 19 year olds would provide further help, which could be crucial in rural, rural areas, for example, in helping a young person gain a driving licence, often a necessity for uh, work in a rural area or for actually getting to work. There has been frustration in Dumfries and Galloway over the years that the national organisations, Scottish Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland, have been perceived as having a one-size-fits-all approach, more appropriate for the central belt and urban Scotland, which does not work well for small rural businesses. I am told that this is changing, and that there is now a recognition that regional equity has been missing in economic policy and national business support, and that is very welcome. For example, as I said earlier, 90% of the businesses in Dumfries and Galloway employ 10 people or fewer. Many of these businesses would love to take on a modern apprentice, but they don't have the capacity to do so. And that was highlighted in the Finance Committee report to which Gavin Brown referred. Being able to share an apprenticeship with another small business in the same line of business could provide these employers with trained workers for the future and give young people the chance to develop their skills and employability. We need national action on law pay, the ending of zero-hour contracts, the implementation of the living wage rather than the minimum wage. But these developments already underway in Dumfries and Galloway also demonstrate the importance of local expertise in developing employability strategies. Power over many of these decisions is best devolved to local authorities and their partners. Like Margaret McCulloch, I therefore hope that further powers over employment, as those are devolved to this Parliament, powers will also be further devolved to local authorities to equip them to provide the services that they identify their areas as needing. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Nigel Don to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Presiding officer, and I'm actually delighted to be following Dr. Elaine Murray because I'd also like to consider the issues in my very rural community, although I hasten to add that I'm a little bit nearer Aberdeen, and therefore I think probably the average wage is a little bit higher as a consequence. In order for folk to, to find a job, of course, there has to be a job air, there. And in order to make any sense of all of this, we therefore need economic growth. We need sustainable economic growth, of course. But rural communities need jobs, I would suggest, that are local jobs. The difficulty we have is that people have moved out of obvious forms of employment over the years. I'm not sure quite how far back we would have to go when people moved off the land. It was probably a century ago, I suggest. People have now also moved out of the large factories, mostly, across our landscape. And folk are now actually moving out of the high street. Shops are closing down because we no longer shop like that. Those kind of businesses are not coming back. And so we not only have to look after our hate streets, but we have to recognize that people finding employment have to find ways of bringing jobs to them. Otherwise, commuting is not just going to be the norm, it's actually going to be necessary. Now, if you've got to move or a job has got to come to you, then you are at a disadvantage if you have children, if you have disabilities, or you're unskilled. And none of that is remotely remarkable and it's all been talked about before. But I think the point I'd like to make is that unless we address education and skills, then employability services are not going to take us very far. We actually have to have more people who are more employable in order to create the economic growth which is necessary and which is the solution to the employability problem itself. I'd also briefly just like to, to make the point that mental health issues, and they have been discussed already, are hugely important in this. I'm not sure how many colleagues have actually been made redundant or been unemployed for a while. I do have that T-shirt. Actually, being unemployed is a mental health issue, regardless of the opportunities that you actually face. So, picking up on what Gavin Brown, I think, very helpfully introduced us to earlier, education is a key. Long-term thinking is necessary for governments across every realm. Um, and we do have to get through this single-year funding for services. It does no use to anybody. We do need long-term evaluation of what's going on, and this does give me an opportunity just to say to governments, again, longitudinal studies really do provide long-term data which gives you some clues as to what's going on, otherwise you are guessing. I was grateful to Richard Simpson for his comments about equalisation of opportunity, because, of course... An employer is instinctively and quite automatically going to go for the employee who provides the greatest flexibility. 
which means they are automatically looking for the flip side of any disability because that reduces flexibility. You don't have to be unkind or ungracious about that. It's just if there's a choice, you're going to go where flexibility allows you to go. The issue of, of disabled folk getting into apprenticeships has already been well aired. I'm glad that's the case. That really does need to be explored. Um, but I'd like to go a little bit beyond that, presiding officer, because those who might be going to get into apprenticeships are actually quite close to employment. And my concern really is those who within my communities who are not close to employment, because I think those are the folk we need to worry about. A brief thought, though, on the way about the living wage. I do not understand why we have a difficulty in recognizing living wage is actually an economic necessity. How on earth can we justify people being in work in poverty? I mean, just to say it makes a point that something's wrong somewhere. And we then have a position where governments, whatever level, are actually subsidizing bad employers. I'm sorry, guys, that's just got to be wrong. And I just wonder when we will actually collectively get our minds around there. They really must deal with that. And if the UK government thinks that the living wage is too high for its minimum wage, the UK government just needs to understand it's wrong. Now, looking at programs getting folk into work, I'd like to suggest that arguably that is merely a state-sponsored state recruitment service. Because if all those employment services do is to put people into jobs which already exist, then actually those folk could have found those jobs anyway. We're merely facilitating it. The added value of an employment service, I'd like to suggest, providing officer, is ensuring that folk who are close to being able to get those jobs are upskilled in whatever sense we have to take the word in such a way that the economic expansion can take place via new jobs. And if we keep our eye on that, I think there's a much better chance that we'll provide the right kind of services. I think Margaret McCulloch made some very interesting points about that. So what we need is a holistic approach which looks at the individual and says, why is this person not able to get a job and how do we improve their employability in such a way that jobs will be able to be created around them and they will be able to do them rather than merely displacing somebody else who might otherwise do that job. I'd like to return, therefore, to the issue of mental health. I made the point earlier, I know fine well from my own experience, that simply being unemployed creates a mental health issue. If being unemployed leaves you in a position where you don't think you will be employable, that gives you a bigger mental health problem. That is itself a barrier to doing the things that you should do to change your skills, to look for jobs and to widen yourself to, all, to, to the opportunities that there might be. Um, I'm, I'm picking up here on experience, of course, from constituents. Constituents who find themselves going to, the, to uh, well, in fact, often going to the uh, CAB as, as, as well as ourselves, but who've gone to the job centre to be told they should apply for this, that and the other job, because if they don't apply for them, they won't get their job seekers allowance. They're applying for jobs that they're never going to take, they're never going to get, ones that may be a significant distance away. Um, a lady in Montrose who was told that she should be looking for a job in Perth. Now, if you happen to be able to walk to the station at both ends, then that's merely an hour's journey and £16.70 a day. If you've got any kind of transport problem at either end, that's probably very difficult unless you're seeking a relatively highly paid job, which by definition the person probably isn't. There are all sorts of barriers simply due to transport, due to family requirements, and due to, the say, to mental health issues, which folk in rural communities find much more difficult to work their way around than they do in urban areas. So let me conclude there, presiding officer, making a special plea that whatever it is we do, we bear in mind that the city opportunity is very much easier for folk than the opportunity in rural communities. And we must address that through the systems that we set in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Richard Lyle. <coughs> Thank you very much. The government's motion today talks of effective and targeted employment support for individuals, their families and communities, and of the importance of collaboration and engagement in making that happen. Siobhan McMahon and others have spelled out a number of specific actions that are required to support those furthest from the labour market and the importance of making work pay and promoting safety at work. 
and I'm glad that the government has accepted Labour's amendment along those lines. But if employment support is to deliver for individuals and their communities, that must also include people already in work who are faced with the prospect of losing their jobs. Sadly, there are all too many people in Scotland today who are in that position. We heard yesterday that hundreds of paper workers at Tullis Russell faced redundancy hard on the heels of Scottish Power's decision to close the power station at Lunganet next year. Both these closures will have a major impact on their local communities in the next few months, and both will require urgent action by all levels of government working together. <clears throat> the biggest test of the Scottish Government's approach this year, however, will be in the oil industry in the North East. Nowhere is there a more pressing example of the need for government action to help workers to continue to have the opportunity to work. Today's Aberdeen Evening Express reports nearly 400 further jobs at risk at Petrofac, Wood Group and AMEC. And these are only the latest in a long list of company announcements of job losses in the sector in the last few months. Thousands of jobs have already gone as major employers have shed either contractors or directly employed staff in response to a low oil price wiping out the short-term profitability of most of the North Sea. Many more jobs have gone from companies in the supply chain and many thousands more, more remain at risk. The question in relation to today's, today's debate is whether the Scottish Government and its agencies are indeed providing the targeted employment support which people need and whether the right levels of collaboration and engagement are being achieved to make that happen. We on this side called for urgent responses from both the Scottish and UK Government as the oil price began its dramatic fall at the end of last year. We argued for a resilience fund to allow local councils to support supply chain companies in the face of sudden economic shocks, and Aberdeen City Council hosted a summit to address the oil jobs crisis. The Scottish Government supported that summit, although it didn't support the resilience fund, and it announced that it would set up an energy jobs task force uh, with Lena Wilson of Scottish Enterprise in the chair. That was welcome, and so too was the PACE initiative which followed and which organised a jobs fair for oil industry workers at Petodri five weeks ago. That oil, fair, that jo oil jobs fair attracted some 850 people, reflecting the sheer scale of job losses and insecurity in the sector. And the PACE approach of cross-agency working is the right starting place. It reflects an approach of collaboration and engagement, but it is not enough on its own. Government's approach to the oil jobs crisis has to be not just about supporting those who have lost their jobs, it also has to be how to limit the number of redundancies in the first place. So it is good that the Energy Jobs Task Force has also begun to address some of the other issues that affect security of employment in the sector. Just as Nigel Don said that you need sustainable economic growth to achieve employability, so you need uh, sustainable uh, employment policies uh, in order to maintain jobs that already exist. The issue, I think, is how far the good intentions expressed by government and its partners are reflected in the actions which follow. The minutes of the March meeting of the Energy Jobs Task Force were published earlier today. They show, for example, an oil industry employer making the case for increased trade union representation. And he was right, trade unions are indeed best placed to reflect the actual experience and concerns of workers faced with the risk of redundancy. And I'm glad that Unite, the RMT and the STUC are all involved in the Energy Jobs Task Force. But we have seen decisions and proposals from major employers and from the Offshore Contractors Association to change the terms and conditions of workers offshore in ways which could damage confidence in the industry among some of its most experienced employees. If these proposals go through, many offshore workers who currently work two weeks on with three weeks off will be faced with a change to three on and three off without the agreement of their trade unions. And that could well have the result that many older, more experienced workers decide it's no longer worth their while to continue working offshore. That potential loss of experience and expertise uh, could prove difficult to replace. A very pertinent issue uh, for those of us concerned with employability, particularly in this case in relation to older workers. The Energy Jobs Task Force adopted a new objective last month to encourage and influence flexible approaches to employment that limit job losses and avoid losing skills and talent vital in the medium term. That is very welcome. It could mean, for example, offering experienced workers more choices over their working hours, securing their continuing employment, 
and the opportunity for younger workers to continue to benefit from their experience. That is the approach that we require in employability policy going forward, a flexible approach to the workforce that makes uh, jobs uh, uh, available to more people than would otherwise be the case. But the reality in the offshore sector is quite different. Longer shifts offshore, fewer colleagues working, will make life harder for older workers and put the skills and talent required for the future more at risk. So the test for employers and for the Scottish Government and its agencies is to turn the right words about employability and future jobs into the right actions. If government and employers practice what they preach, they can make a real difference to prospects of employment for people young and old, not just in the energy industry today, but right across the economy in the future. Many thanks. I now call on Richard Lyle to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, I hope my remarks in this chamber today, this afternoon will look at this debate from a different angle and widen the scope of uh, discussion, possibly. I believe that it is important from the outset to remember that while empl employment services are still a reserved issue, this SNP Scottish Government is taking a number of steps with the powers of devolution that it has to develop an approach to employment support that delivers our ambitions for fair work, social justice and sustainable economic growth. Indeed, in Scotland's economy strategy, investment, innovation, inclusive growth and internalisation have a key role to play in the improvement of the Scottish labour market. In particular, I would like to focus on the aspect of investment, as the key actions within the strategy are to implement the recommendations of the Commission for the Development of Scotland's Young Workforce a pioneering piece of work commissioned by this Government that I will, I believe, truly deliver a better future for Scotland's young people and, in addition, as part of the Youth Employment Strategy, this Government has increased the number of modern apprentices delivered uh, to 25,000 and the Government plans to increase this to 30,000 by the year 2020. That's the difference between this Government and Labour. We deliver for Scotland's young people from our policy on opportunities for all, which is an explicit commitment to an offer of a place in learning or training to every 16, 19-year-old who is not currently in employment, education or training. We are the only government in the UK to have a dedicated youth employment minister who is working towards our goal of cutting youth unemployment by 40 per cent by the year 2021 and, of course, exceeding our manifesto commitment to maintain 116,000 full-time equivalent college places and providing the best student support in the UK. That indeed in stark contrast to half-hearted commitments by the Scottish Labour Party, who claim in this motion to bring an end to insecure employment with a ban on exploitative zero-hour contracts. If that's not an example of hypocrisy, presiding officer, I don't know what is. No, I won't. Where the Labour Party claim to aim exploitative zero, zero hour contracts. How can they defend that? Well, apart from Ms. McMacken, who, on admission this afternoon, admitted that Labour controlled Glasgow City Council, where almost 1,700 workers at a city council and its alios are currently on zero hour contracts with no sign of a council helping them. A Labour Council. A Labour Council. It's clear, presiding officer, the Labour Party say one thing and do another. But this SNP government does what it says. I knew that, that would certainly annoy them. And that's why on May the 7th, the people of Scotland will reject Labour and their vision for continued austerity. Moving on, presiding officer, we we'll look again at the actions of the SNP government, who have led by example in being the first Scottish government to ensure that all staff covered by public sector pay policy are paid at least the Scottish living wage. They don't like it when you tell the truth, and that's the one thing I love about the Labour Party. They never like it. Since 2011-12, this covers 180,000 people in Scotland working for central government agencies and the NHS. So whilst Labour continued to continue to pontificate, we have continued to make clear their support of the principle of the living wage campaign, as well as this SNP government continuing to encourage public, private and third sector organisations to ensure that all staff are paid a decent and fair wage. The Scottish Government, however, cannot set 
pay levels of those employees who are not covered by the Scottish Government pay policy. We continue to not only be pioneering in our approach, but we're also the party which is delivering for Scotland. I'd like to make reference at this point in my remarks, presiding officer, to Inclusion Scotland briefing, which was helpful, providing in, in the, in, in that that they highlighted this, the Smith Commission's proposals. The Scottish Parliament will all have all powers over support for unemployed people through the employment programme currently contracted by DWP. However, both the narrative and the draft clauses appear to restrict this power to employment support schemes that last over a year. It is not clear why this restriction has been included, and it appears to be a direct contradiction of the Smith Commission proposals. Presiding officer, I, like many others in this chamber, will tend to agree with the view of Inclusion Scotland, in that it is indeed important that what the Smith Commission, Smith Commission proposes for the Scottish Parliament is what is delivered for this Scottish Parliament. That surely is what was agreed through the Smith Commission uh, pro pro processes. And that's why even it's more crucial that we elect a strong team of SNP MPs to ensure that we get what we were promised during the referendum, the closest thing to federalism and home rule. If on the 7th of May, Scotland elects a strong bloc of SNP MS MPs, they will support targeted reductions to employers' national insurance contributions to support job creation and the extension of the living wage. They will support action to make work fair, including ending unfair and exploitative zero-hour contracts, and SNP MPs will back a minimum wage of £8.70 by 2020 and support extending measures to extend the living wage across the UK. That's what the people of Scotland get by voting SNP on 7th May. In my remarks, President Officer, I have highlighted the many actions which this Government has taken to, to deliver change and a fairer future for Scotland's young people, but more generally in delivering for Scotland's future workforce. I believe that we are a party and a Government which is delivering not only for the people of Scotland, but for the future of Scotland. And it's time the Labour Party woke up to that fact. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Margaret MacDougall. Um, up to eight minutes, please, Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, it's quite interesting to find that we can make such, actually, on the broad uh, sweep of policy, a uh, common cause with our colleagues to the left, and I very much welcome that. Uh, I looked at the amendment and I thought to myself, I could see words in it that the government might pick at and so on and so forth. But I think when we put the people of Scotland who have the category of problems that we're debating today uh, into the mix, it's right and proper that we try and build uh, some consensus. And I want to try and do that, if I may. Um, perhaps one of the things that we should think about is labels. Uh, we've got quite a lot of labels that have been kicking around in the debate that we've used. Um, we talk about young people, we talk about uh, disabled people, and, and we, we haven't, funnily enough, talked about old people. I speak as the third oldest person uh, in the debate today. Um, I'll be 70 next year, although someone said to me quite recently, but a very young 70. So maybe I'm both young and old simultaneously. I, I, I simply don't know. But... There are a number of groups we haven't talked about. Uh, Richard Simpson and my colleague Nigel Dawn did talk about people who suffer degrees of uh, mental ill health, and I think Siobhan McMahon also made uh, reference to that. And I think we've got to make sure that when we look at people with mental health, when we look at people who are recovering from addictions, when we look at people who've come out of the criminal justice system, when we look at people who've got particular literacy and numeracy problems, when we look at people who, for whatever reason, are not comfortable with, perhaps through disability, perhaps through uh, a lack of access with modern technology, we've got a wide range of different issues and that brings us to the heart of the matter. We're not talking about categories. We're actually talking about individuals. We're going to solve the problems that face us in this area of public policy one person at a time. And with each person, we have to make sure that we develop 
what is appropriate for them to help them. Work is an important part of most people's lives, but not because it provides economic security, although it has to do that, but because it puts in the mind of people who work a value. It says, you are valued, you are making a contribution. I think work has a purpose, but that purpose is not to build a stronger economy. That purpose is not to increase taxation. That is to help the individuals. It's about making sure that they have that sense of purpose. And people have been out of work uh, for some considerable time and bring to the, the issue of re-engaging with work or engaging with work for the first time uh, have all sorts of issues that they have in their own mind and that they may create in the minds of others that we have to make sure that we deal with. When we're looking at, for example, people with mental ill health, somehow, despite the fact that one in three uh, women and one in four men will suffer some degree of mental ill health at some time in their life, it is somehow seen as a tiny little minority uh, issue uh, that doesn't affect us. And whenever you've had, as people will do from time to time, uh, mental ill health, you're stuck with a label for the rest of your life. Employers will get a great deal out of drawing people in with the wide range of issues that I've delineated by having people that can contribute from their experience, adverse it may be, to improve uh, the operation of workplaces. Now, the presiding officer at an early stage in the debate uh, said that this would be a debate where there'd be some room for invention, and I'm going to take him up on his word. I, as an older person, uh, among others, um, would suggest that perhaps we're missing a trick in relation to how we use older people to bring in younger people with less experience of work. As older people reach the end of their working career, and for many through choice rather than necessity, that is later than it might have been, they, we have a core of people here can be the mentors of the new, who actually might wish to work fewer hours, but might feel there is a good social purpose uh, in bringing in people who've got particular barriers to getting into the world of work that they, with their experience, might help. And I wonder if it's time that we collectively turned our mind to how we might actually uh, make that work. Because as one gets older, uh, one may wish to work fewer hours. My father, when he was uh, 65 as a GP, gave up working nights. When he was 70, he gave up uh, working weekends. So from the age of 70, he started to work what he thought was a normal working week. Now, he was a bit different from the generality, but the pattern was one that we see increasingly, people reducing their workload. That is an opportunity to get people into the engagement with people, giving them that sense of worth, giving them a tiny little skill, perhaps in the first place, that enables them to get in through the front door and become depended on. Because there's nothing gives people more sense of worth than the idea that what they are doing is something that is necessary to support other people with much greater experience and much greater skills. And the old lags, like myself and like others, perhaps might be the key to unlocking that. Now, another thing that we've talked about, uh, which is quite relevant in my area of the country, is gender gaps. And we've talked about uh, how there is a huge skew uh, very few women going into many of the traditional male-dominated industries. I very much welcome the fact that when I go to uh, what is now the North East College, previously Banff and Buchan College, uh, on the oil engineering courses, there's always a decent number of women, not yet enough, not yet enough, presiding officer, but a decent number of women who can see a career ahead of them that is rewarding intellectually, rewarding economically, and will engage the mental faculties of people. And I very much welcome that. But that pattern is not repeated eh, over enough of Scotland. It isn't something that we're seeing women challenging men uh, for the places uh, in the, the, what is a, a, a traditional male industry. 
I spent 30 years of my life in information technology, and when I started, the number of men and women doing the technical jobs was roughly equivalent, which was quite interesting. And of course, the reason for that is nobody knew about computers, and it was a bit of an illegitimate thing. I'm talking the 1960s when I started in it. And so therefore, the men didn't automatically take it over. Things have gone downhill since then. And it's now an industry where men dominate once again. So I think we've got to try and find new models and new ways of mentoring people, including women, including people with mental ill health, and uh, sideways reference a little bit by uh, Richard Simpson, uh, people who have the ability to recover from addictions and the desire to do so. That means helping companies who are prepared to make that effort helping companies who are going to support ex-offenders who have hopefully in the prison service improved literacy and numeracy, they now need to add employment to their portfolio. And, presiding officer, I think uh, that what we've got before us in a debate today is one where a very large uh, amount of agreement, I think the Labour amendment which talks about wider reforms of employment policy, to deliver a more socially just Scotland is spot on. It actually captures the whole point of this. Now, um, the, 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 the amendment also talks about industrial injury. We've moved on a great deal from 1836 when my great-great-grandfather uh, died as a serf in the coal mining industry. So low down the pecking order, there is no record of his death. Uh, presiding officer, we can make progress. This debate ought to be, and hopefully is, a contribution to an ongoing debate on how we do that. Many, many thanks. And I now call on Margaret MacDougall to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, presiding officer. I welcome this debate on International Workers' Day. And while I support the government's motion, it doesn't go far enough. And that's why I welcome and support the Labour Amendment today, which seeks to ensure that we have wider reforms of employment policy. We need to ensure that people are supported when trying to find employment and are equipped with the right skills to find well-paid and secure work. I'm going to use my time today to discuss supporting people into work, specifically in relation to third sector support and addressing insecurity and unfairness in the workplace. The third sector has been invaluable in supporting people into work. They have done a great job despite the lack of resources. That's why I believe the third sector should be involved at the early stages of setting up future employability services. This would ensure that employability services could move away from sanctions and adopt a people-centric approach. It's hard enough to find work. It's even harder on a six-week sanction when your priority then becomes how will you pay the bills and feed your family, never mind find work. The third sector's approach is tried and tested. Take, for example, Community Jobs Scotland, which provides paid jobs for people in the sector. CGIS has given 5,871 paid opportunities with nearly 600 different third sector employers across Scotland. The individual receives real life employment experience linked with on-the-job training and development. And in return, the third sector receives increased staffing capacity to achieve its aims and objectives. Almost 67% of people who took part had positive destinations. So in those terms, it's more successful than the UK government work programmes. With the devolution of the work programme to Scotland, we have a great opportunity to do things differently and it's important we involve the third sector from the start. As SVCO states, we need to give people a real choice and meaningful control over their support. This requires accommodating different needs with sufficient flexibility and specialist input as required, an approach already pioneered by the third sector. In terms of addressing insecurity and unfairness in the workplace, we need to make sure not work not only pays, but is secure, so people can plan from day to day and know exactly how much money they have for essentials and bills. Firstly, we need to extend the living wage to public sector procurement contracts, 
an opportunity that was missed recently by the Scottish Government when they chose to vote against Labour amendments, supported by the unions, to introduce the living wage. Boris Johnson sought to do it in London, while the SNP hid behind European Union legislation. At the time, Professor... I'll just take you in a minute, um, Mr John. At the time, Professor Christopher McCrudden, a leading expert on procurement law, social justice and equality, said that to be protected under the Posted Workers Directive, the living wage will need to be provided through laws, regulations and or administrative provisions. A suitable amendment to Section 39 should meet the requirements of the Posted Workers Directive in this respect. Mr John. I'm grateful and, uh, and uh, the lady quotes uh, a, a respected person who believes that it might be possible. Could I merely suggest to the member and the Labour Party that they stop banging this drum? The vast majority of legal opinion and all those who want to err on the side of safety are saying you simply cannot do it. You can do lots of other things around it, but you can't actually do it. When all, when all public sector workers have a living wage, we'll stop banging the drum, Mr John. So if the SNP had been bolder, it would have been possible to avoid any legal challenge. Scottish Labour will ensure that we would use the powers of procurement to provide decent wages. Why won't the SNP? And why, despite the fact it was possible, did you vote down the living wage for public sector procurement contracts? Secondly, we want to see a ban on exploitative zero-hour contracts and bring an end to the insecurity faced daily by an estimated 100,000 Scots. Flexibility in work is a good thing to have, but for too long employers have abused zero-hour contracts. And there is evidence to suggest some companies employ people on them despite the fact they work regular hours. This is wrong. We believe if you work regular hours, you should have a regular pay packet. So instead of consulting on them, as the SNP wish to do, we'll take action and get rid of them. To conclude, presiding officer, I don't know if I'm in my last minute, am I, presiding officer? Take an intervention if you wish. I'll take an intervention from... James Dornan. Can I just get clarification from yourself then? Uh, the zero hours contracts, are you saying that you'll scrap all zero hours contracts? We are saying there is a need for some zero-hour contracts, but there should be flexibility and they shouldn't be abused by employers. To conclude, presiding officer, Scottish Labour believe in fairness and equality. Can we have a bit of calm, please? A Scotland where people earn a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. A Scotland that protects and provides for its workers and a Scotland that offers the best opportunities to all Scots. With this in mind, we can't look at employment and employability as separate issues, as we've heard many times in this debate. So it's disappointing that the government's motion is so narrow in its approach. We need to ensure that when employability services are devolved to Scotland, we adopt a people-centric approach. Moving away from sanctions, working with the third sector and others to make sure everyone gets the right support. But we have to go further than this. We also need to ensure good jobs are available, end this insecurity of zero-hour contracts and low wages, and make sure no one is worse off in work. For the past five years, we have seen a race to the bottom, and ordinary workers across Scotland and the UK have suffered. A vote for Labour on May the 7th is a vote to say no more. Thanks so much. I now call on James Dornan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I didn't know it was for no more. I thought it was for something yes, but uh, that's a, a, obviously a different member of the party. Uh, I was a wee bit concerned at Stuart Stevenson's comments where he said that he was the third oldest person that was taking part in this debate, and I'm looking about to see who the other one was. No disrespect, Richard, but, uh, but thankfully it's not me. The comments about the living wage and the zero hours, I'll, I'll leave to one side because this should be a consensual debate and in the main it has been a consensual debate I think we're all looking for the same outcome here we've just got a, a, a slightly different way of going about it and I'm delighted I have to say I, I'm not sure who it was that spoke earlier on about the when we saw the wording of the amendment that we 
could see how it could be quite difficult for us to accept it, but I'm delighted that we agreed that the bigger picture was more important than playing party politics on an and, and issue such as this. Not everybody's done that, but in the main, that's what this debate has been like. Uh, we've heard a lot in the debate about the good work being done nationally on this subject, and it's true that there are areas of common agreement. So we've just talked about, about devolution of parts of the work programme. And I think it's because we can all agree that where the Scottish Government is able to act and where this place is able to act, we've acted well. And the stats, particularly for women and youth, empl and youth employment figures in Scotland, compare to the rest of the UK and reflect that. And that's in large part due to the particular commitments that we've made to assist more women into the workplace, including through the increase of hours at nursery and the implementation of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, which will provide new powers to increase the amount and flexibility of early learning and childcare. And of course, a continuation and upcoming increase to an additional 10,000 school pupils and 12,000 part-time college students of the educational maintenance allowance has been crucial in the fall of youth unemployment over the last few years. These are all positives the Scottish Government have done and, as said, is part of the reason why there is a consensus around the devolution of the work programme, which is why it's so disheartening to see the UK Government pull back in the agreements made in the Smith Commission about devolution of the work programme. In the words of the SCVO, we are utterly appalled by the UK Government's move to extend its work programme contracts when it was agreed by the Smith Commission that it would transfer to the Scottish Parliament as soon as current contracts expired. They continue, but our disappointment doesn't lie so much in the almost immediate failure to keep the agreement as in the fact that it's impossible to justify why such a broken and failing system would ever be continued. And it's yet another indication of why we need a, this, this I was going to leave this bit out because in the spirit of consensus, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but it's, it's another indication of why we need a strong team of SNP MPs at Westminster yeah, to hold them to account yeah. and to the promises that they have made in the vow and in the Smith Commission. However, whilst the national work is encouraging and we desperately need those greater powers, there's also a lot of work being done locally by organisations to ready people for work. And I just want to highlight a couple of examples from my Cathcart constituency to the Chamber today. Last week I was delighted to welcome volunteers and representatives from Arden Glen Housing Association based in Casimal through to Parliament to see First Minister's questions, have a tour of the Parliament and spend a day in Edinburgh. Arden Glen, like so many housing associations, are doing great work in the local area with their tenants. One example of many I could raise in their The Only Way Is Up personal capacity building programme. Of the 28 learners in the initial programme, 14 stopped attending because seven had found work, six had moved into further education with jobs in Business Glasgow, and one had gained the IT skills they were looking for. Of the 14 remaining learners who continue to attend, nine attend computer classes which focus on welfare reform requirements such as universal job match, CV preparation, and online forum filing, and three have moved on to intermediate general IT to prepare them for work. One of the participants, Thomas, joined the programme after being made redundant from his job of 14 years. He found himself in a situation not too uncommon where he fell out of his depth due to lack of IT skills. He undertook the programme and has found work off the back of it. He said of the experience of the programme that the only way is up was vital in assisting me with my job search. The staff and volunteers at the hall were so welcoming and friendly and put me at ease right from the start. It has really helped my confidence too. When you've been in work for 14 years and a change like redundancy hits you, your confidence really hits rock bottom. I'd recommend joining up to anyone who requires assistance. As the programme says, the only way is up. Castleton Housing Association has a 30-year history of creating positive opportunities for local people. One of their key objectives is to create employment and develop people's skills in an area where there is high unemployment and few career opportunities. They do this through a variety of successful initiatives, including offering their own housing apprenticeships and ensuring that their major suppliers offer apprenticeships. One local youth has been employed for 10 years and is now a housing officer. He's completed his diploma and acts as a role model for other young people in the area. They also offer short-term work experience placements to schools and local unemployed women and have had great results with them moving into positive destinations after. This is also the case for the Community Job Scotland placements and internships. Of the 12 placements that Castleton have offered, all have gone into work or further education upon completion. They also run a highly successful environmental employability programme in Castlemilk Park. This has taken 80 unemployed people through an eight-week training programme. Over the past three years, over 80% of participants have gained qualifications and just over 50% of participants have moved into employment, with over a third of them in the programme coming from workless households. 
it is possible for them and Arden Craig and countless others across the country to offer these programmes to empower local people because of the support they receive from partners, including the Scottish Government. Just think how much more we could do with all the powers for employment here in Scotland. Thank you. And thank you. I now call on Mike Russell to speak up to four minutes, Mr Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I apologise for not being here for the opening speeches, but obviously this has been a considerably detailed debate. But the core Microphone, of this debate Mr. Russell. Is economic, Microphone. The core of this debate is Scotland's economic strategy, which sets out what is called an overarching framework for achieving a more productive, cohesive and fairer Scotland. And that's essentially whatever part of Scotland you come from. There is a difference in being employed or looking for employment between Collinsay and Cumbernauld, between Gia and Gala Shields. But the core issues are the same for the government in terms of uh, increasing competitiveness and tackling inequality. And I want to deal with the tackling of inequality, in particular the four priority areas that are focused on to deliver Scotland's economic strategy. And the first is investing in people and infrastructure in a sustainable way. And it is vitally important in my own constituency, particularly that the work of public bodies is to the fore in this matter. The work of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Business Gateway, um, is very important. But as long they have to be focused along with other public bodies in securing employment and securing infrastructure growth. Because without infrastructure in place, then employment is very hard to find. Uh, some weeks ago, I chaired the first meeting of the Cowell Fixed Link Group. And that is a major infrastructure project, which is a long way away. But it's important that every part of the public sector is engaged in thinking about how such developments could take place. Uh, and recently I've been working with the community in Delavik, one of the remotest villages on the Scottish mainland, who are very keen to establish a hydro scheme, but who require the help of all the public agencies to make that happen. The second pillar of, uh, of growth is uh, fostering a culture of innovation and research and development. And that is possible in rural areas, both through investment through bodies such as the University of the Highlands and Islands, and I'm thinking of the Science Park at Dunstaffnage and the uh, growing work that's done there, but also in some of the priority industries. The natural resources of Scotland are very great. And investing in the Scottish food and drink industry is something that this government has done uh, comprehensively since 2007, is producing the opportunity for innovation. But there must be more of it. The difficulty is being experienced by the dairy uh, industry in, uh, in Kintyre. And the requirement to sustain that because of employment issues uh, arise to, in a, to some degree because of the lack of innovation in that industry. And the success of the New Zealand dairy industry has been because it has been an innovating industry. So there must be continued innovation, but again, it will be the public sector that supports it. And thirdly, presiding officer, promoting inclusive growth is extremely important, particularly in the jobs market. And the role of public agencies and indeed the local MSP, and I've been involved in this very heavily, in promoting jobs fairs and jobs markets throughout the constituency and encouraging employers to think of different ways of employing young and old making sure that there is an opportunity for people where they live is exceptionally important. And finally, the promotion of Scotland on the international stage is vital. Tourism plays a, a great uh, role in that. Uh, so do things like food and drink industries, and so does the industry of aquaculture, which I know the Cabinet Secretary is very familiar with, having had that portfolio after myself. And to see the excellence of Scottish food and drink and the excellence of, of Scottish salmon promoted across the world does bring people to Scotland and does make them think about how people earn their living in parts of rural Scotland. It is extremely important, you know, everything that we do in this chamber and everything the Scottish Government does, that there is a focus on those places that are outside the central belt, that in each rural and remote community there is a, 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 a investment in opportunity. And that requires supporting employment, but it is the state, it is the public purse that has the largest responsibility. And I'm quite sure that that needs to be remembered again and again. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you. And we now move to closing speeches. And I call on Gavin Brown. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Brown. Uh, Presiding Officer, thank you. I've just realised that uh, in my opening speech, I neglected to outline how the Conservative group would be voting this afternoon. Uh, so let me take the chance to do that. Now, I thought the Scottish Government motion was perfectly reasonable, uh, one that we uh, would have supported uh, on its own. It seemed to me to be a motion that wanted to explore issues and uh, look for collaboration amongst political parties and therefore it's one uh, which, as I say, we would have happily supported. 
In terms of the uh, Labour Amendment, plenty uh, parts within it with which I do agree uh, and could happily have supported. I particularly acknowledge their um, part about the low levels of disabled people on modern apprenticeships in Scotland. Um, but ultimately, we're not able uh, to support the Labour Amendment. I have a particular concern, I have to say, about the uh, last section, um, investing uh, in a future fund for all young people, not in education, to give all young people in Scotland the best possible employment support. That is obviously uh, a direct link to the policy announced by Jim Murphy just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's one which, uh, in my view, uh, we're unable to support, um, I'm afraid to say. I am surprised, I have to say, that the SNP are able to support that particular policy um, because a couple of weeks ago they weren't quite so enthusiastic about the policy. And to some extent, uh, perhaps the Labour Party has had a bit of a coup today uh, in terms of getting uh, the government to commit to that. And uh, who knows, perhaps even by five o'clock, they'll have convinced Richard Lyle uh, to support uh, their amendment as well. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, ultimately, I think this debate uh, was a debate of two parts. Uh, the first part, I think, was outlined by Rosanna Cunningham in her opening 30 seconds, uh, where she said this is the beginning of a collaborative process involving government, parliament and other stakeholders. And I think that part uh, of the debate, I have to say, has been a success. Uh, we've had some very interesting contributions uh, from all parts of the chamber and a huge number of issues, I think, which uh, were ones we may have been aware of before but were worth repeating, and a couple of issues which uh, were perhaps fresh and new and can help to complement uh, government thinking over the coming weeks and months. Margaret McCulloch, I think, put it well when she said we need to have a broader debate about how we take the process forward. There were a number of references to the Finance Committee report from a couple of years ago, and I commend that to anybody who wants to drive the policy process forward in employability. We heard about the specific rural elements, most recently from uh, Mike Russell, uh, but before that, Elaine Murray and, I have to say, Nigel Dawn made some uh, pretty valuable contributions in that regard. Elaine Murray also talked about an element of the uh, committee report that I'd forgotten about, I have to say, but uh, it came flooding back to me as soon as she mentioned it. And that's the idea where a lot of smaller businesses, not just in rural, rural areas, but obviously in some rural areas, um, a lot of smaller businesses did say uh, that they wanted to take on an apprentice, and they had uh, quite literally half a job for an apprentice. Um, and if you could have the sharing of an apprentice between several companies or organisations, actually I think we might find a, a significant additional number that would end up taking an apprentice on. I know there are some uh, difficulties with it. I know it's not quite as simply as uh, putting two and two together, but perhaps uh, we can make progress in that. And I think if we can, uh, that would be a very welcome step forward. We heard some good local examples of uh, activities. Mark McDonald talked about one in his constituency, which had an 80% plus uh, success rate. Uh, I'd be interested to hear more of the details of that because anything with a success rate of that uh, percentage is worth, worthy of further examination. Uh, and they also had, I think, an interesting contribution, as we normally do, from Stuart Stevenson, who brought mental health uh, to the fore, uh, quite rightly. And then, while he was uh, freewheeling, I think, at this stage, his suggestion of mentoring, I have to say, uh, was a pretty interesting one. The idea of getting those with uh, huge experience to... Um, who eventually want to do slightly fewer hours, passing on uh, more of their knowledge in a perhaps a more structured way over time uh, is something that, again, I think uh, was a pretty valid contribution. So I think the first part of the debate was a big success. For me, the second part of the debate there was a little disappointing because the second part, I think, was the Scottish Government basically saying we need more powers because the UK doesn't do it terribly well and we do everything completely brilliantly. Um, I could obviously exaggerate slightly, but that was, the, that was the subtext. That was the subtext of what the Scottish Government wanted to say. We do it so well here, we do it so well here, um, that that's why we need everything. But when actually pressed on any of their own policies, the Scottish Government, I have to say, were unable to answer questions and were unable to hold themselves to account for their own policies. On apprenticeships, the overall numbers are welcome, and I think all parts of the chambers talked about that. But on the figures given to us by Inclusion Scotland, there is a real difficulty there. Now, it was described by the government as a challenge, but these figures from Inclusion Scotland come from 2012-2013. We're now in 2015, Deputy Presiding Officer. We should be at a stage where the government is able to say more than it's a bit of a challenge, particularly 
if the same figures in England, and I haven't had these verified, these have come to me from the Scottish Children's Services Coalition, but if they're true, where it's 8.7% in England, as opposed to 0.2% in Scotland, that is not just a small difference. That is obviously a completely uh, different approach and something which ought to be investigated urgently by the Scottish Government as soon as this debate is finished. So that's one issue where I think they failed. On the Youth Employment Scotland Fund, Deputy Presiding Officer, one of their flagship policies, the Scottish Government have been unable to say from inquiries through SPICE from PQs last year and again from questions today, they haven't been able to tell us how many jobs have been created and how many of these placements, more importantly, turned into longer term jobs after the initial six months. Of course, I'm delighted to take it in for sure. Um, yeah, Annalee. just on, on the point of the Youth Employment Scotland Fund, of course it is an employer recruitment incentive approach and is therefore not directly comparable to the work programme. I'm sure the member would accept that. And in terms of the member's other point about uh, evaluation, uh, yes, that's quite right. There will be an evaluation and, of course, the findings of the evaluation will be shared uh, uh, with the Parliament uh, uh, as soon as they are available. Thank you. In your final minute now, Mr. I'm not, I'm not sure that intervention casts the Scottish Government in a particularly good light, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, they said it would create 10,000 opportunities. Not my words, John Swinney's words. The key plank of their budget for 2013-14 was that they would create 10,000 opportunities. And all that we are asking now, several years later, is how many opportunities have been created? Surely the Scottish Government must know this figure. The figure is not going to change for 13-14, given that we're well outside that financial year. They must know, and they told uh, Tavish Scott in an answer uh, last year that we, they would tell us everything at the beginning of this year, and they haven't done so. So we're simply asking the Scottish Government to tell us what has happened to this flagship policy and actually has it delivered results? Now, I'm being told to close Deputy Presiding Officer, but I hope the Minister, in summing up, will actually give us some answers to the challenges posed to the Scottish Government instead of just criticising others. Thank you. Many, many thanks. And I now call on Michael McMahon. Nine minutes, please, Mr McMahon. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, commitments I had today here in Parliament prevented me from attending the annual International Workers Memorial Day event at Summerlee Heritage uh, Park in Coat Bridge, as I would have liked to, as I normally do. So I thank the Scottish Government for holding this debate this afternoon so that my colleague Siobhan McMahon could lodge an amendment which recognises the importance of today, as she stated in the amendment, to both remember the dead and fight for the living. And it's good that we're debating employability, but we should not just be looking at how we get people into work, but considering what type of employment people should have the right to expect and how we can achieve that. And Margaret McCulloch's speech drew those issues out particularly well. Ms McMahon was also right to raise the fact that the Scottish Government should be committing to use its powers of procurement to extend the living wage and bring to an end insecure employment with a ban on exploited of zero-hour contracts. And to assist uh, James Dornan and Richard Lyle further, that means Glasgow, Greenock, Grangemouth and any part of Scotland that begins with or without a G. I hope that is clear. Because it's good to hear that the Scottish Government agrees. Certainly. Okay, uh, just for clarification then, is it with or without the exploitative aspect of it? Because that wasn't clear from uh, both contributors earlier on. Michael McMahon. I don't know whether it's just that Mr Dorn is hard of understanding or hard of hearing. I, try, I said to be of assistance, it is exploitative contracts. There is a clear de difference and the trade union organisations know the difference between a flexible contract and an exploitative zero-hour contract. And I think you should go away and try and understand that yourself, Mr Dornan. I'm particularly pleased that um, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary indicated her support for this afternoon's uh, amendment from the, Scotti the, the Scottish Labour Party because it does promote make-work-pay contracts uh, as well as our, our commitment on zero-hour contracts. It doesn't chime with what they said when we announced them in our manifesto, it's certainly not in their manifesto. So I wonder why they chose to support our amendment this afternoon, but I welcome it anyway. Just unfortunate that clearly someone didn't send Mr Lyle the memo. Uh, he traduced Labour for its position on these issues, and he confirmed that, in spite of what the Cabinet Secretary uh, said, that he does not support Labour's position. I think the SNP 
should clarify that for us this afternoon. I was reminded as he spoke of the axiom that it's better to stay silent and let people think you're a fool than open your mouth and prove it. But I commend Mr. L I commend that Mr. Lyle looks. <laughs> I God, it's a Richard Lyle. We'll do it again. <laughs> I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw that. At, at the end of the day, I've, I've, I've called you for what you are, not, not what you believe you are. I think right. Mr Lyle uh, just ex uh, continued to expose the, the point that I was making. So I commend <laughs> that Mr Lyle looks more to his colleague uh, Stuart Stevenson, who clearly understood the message that was being delivered from his front bench this afternoon and did take us into a broad consensus on the points that, that we can agree on and I think that we should agree on. So while our amendment recognises the work being done by the Scottish Government with the third sector, and I think it's right that we do that, there is a lot of help to prepare disabled people for work. We understand that as well. But you cannot deny the point being made by others in, in the, the debate this afternoon. When you look at Inclusion Scotland statistics, the latest figures show that employment rate for disabled people in Scotland has fallen to just 40.8% despite overall employment rates for the whole working age population rising to almost 75 per cent. That is something that we have to look at. Within those figures, the points that were made, and I think it is worth reiterating, the fact that in 2012-13, just 63 apprentices out of 25,691 modern apprenticeships went to young disabled people. That is a shameful 0.2 per cent. And no matter how much the government might want to pat itself on the back for its achievement and its numbers, and I take the point that the Stuart Stevenson made, we want to get to figures like 30,000 modern apprenticeships, but I think it would also be useful when you're making that point not to compare it to the statistics we had under the previous Labour administration, because you would be comparing apples with oranges. In the previous Labour administration, Mr Maxwell, if you check your facts, only at, uh, level four and three at SVQ were counted as modern apprenticeships. The Scottish Government now counts Level 2 and other SVQ in work qualifications. I'm not decrying that. That is not a bad thing. But please don't try and say that you have moved to this figure of 25,000 by comparing it to what was counted before. You're counting them differently, and that is an important point. So no one seeing those figures could get, disagree that disabled people's ongoing exclusion from the labour market because of discrimination and a failure to provide the necessary support to access employment has to be tackled. That's why Labour uses its amendment to call for an early review in the context of Scotland taking over disability benefits with the expected implementation of the Smith Commission proposals. We believe that the wider reforms of employment policy are required to, de to deliver a more socially just Scotland. And in my experience, and listening to employers tells me that at present the expectations of the private sector are far too often at odds with the structures for employment programmes that are designed and run by public sector agencies like Job Centre Plus and Skills Development Scotland. That's why any employment programme must have the earliest possible private sector involvement so that employment initiatives have the best possible chance to succeed in meeting the needs of the business sectors that we rely on to provide the sustainable economic growth that we all desire. And I think that was a point that I do agree with uh, Stuart Maxwell on. But the main criticism that we have is that it appears, and it's been raised by uh, people in the debate, the Skills Development Scotland seem to identify the outcome they want and then try to fit the round SME pegs into square training place holes that they've designed to meet their targets. Elaine Murray highlighted an important example of SDS, one size fit all attitude in her area. Nigel Dawn and Lewis MacDonald also uh, brought in, introduced perspectives into the debate on consideration of local job market conditions. And I think that that's a, a very important aspect. We often hear businesses and government are under intense pressure to become more strategic about developing and assessing employability initiatives and the skill sets that need to be created to meet current and envisaged skill shortages. Business groups claim to be linking strategic planning more directly with training, development and recruitment, while our education and skill system claims to be moving towards skill-based outcomes. 
And government agencies are keen on certifying learners' employability skills, be they modern apprenticeships, SVQs or other vocational courses, as a means of indicating that people have been enabled to negotiate their transition to the world of work. However, what seems to be missing is a robust evidence that we need to ensure that that is being achieved. And while there is no doubt that employers and educators know that the development of skills is essential to Scotland's competitiveness and growth in highly competitive global markets, they find it difficult to take effective concerted action to establish programmes for delivering them. Now, whether they disagree or not with this opinion, there seems to me to be a certain lack of clarity about what employability skills are often seen as and how they are connected to one another and how to approach the process of developing them. The, the connecting the separate worlds of work and education by developing uh, employability skills should also help promote a culture of lifelong learning that will provide benefits to the economy at large in the longer term. I'm afraid you must now draw to a close. Thanks. A, a number of people talked about the long-term importance of this, and I think that was an important aspect to draw out of the debate. So I look forward to the response from the Minister, and hope that as we go forward this afternoon, we can continue to have that consensus that brings us to a point that we agree just how important an issue this is for Scotland as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Annabelle Ewing to wind up the debate. Minister, I'm afraid all of the extra time has been used up. If you could finish by five o'clock, I would be grateful. I will certainly uh, do my best, presiding officer, and thank you very much. Uh, today's debate has been interesting and wide-ranging, and I do welcome the contributions from all members this afternoon. In a moment, I will uh, try to pick up on a number of the points uh, made, but first I would like to, to stress, as the Cabinet Secretary made clear in her opening speech, it is important uh, to say that we want to listen to ideas and views from across the board and, as far as possible, to build a consensual and a collaborative approach to the devolution of employment support services. We do intend to engage with a broad range of stakeholders and service providers through our public consultation to be launched this year. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank SCBO, Inclusion Scotland and the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland for having taken the time to provide briefings for today's debate. These briefings reflect the enthusiasm on the part of the third sector to make a contribution to the debate and ensure indeed that their suggestions are uh, duly considered. Um, in the context of this debate this afternoon, presiding officer, we will focus uh, particularly and indeed in the consultation that we launch on the position of uh, users of employment support services because we need to understand their needs to ensure that they uh, are empowered uh, to uh, make progress into the world of work by being closely involved in the development and in the design of the employment support services. And we take this approach because we do believe that those who use services can make a critical contribution to how these services are delivered for the best. And we take this approach because we believe in participative democracy, empowering communities, building community capacity and enabling more people to participate in decision making about issues that affect them. And we also take this approach because we believe uh, the devolution of employment support services does provide Scotland with significant opportunities which we intend to seize and to maximise. Now, responding to some of the um, points raised, uh, I would uh, welcome uh, Siobhan McMahon's uh, approach to the debate today because she came along with some suggestions and that's what this debate is all about. Uh, and indeed, in the terms of the point that she made about the website, uh, I think that was an important point and it's something I'll certainly take back to officials because uh, the point of communication is to communicate. If there are people that that is not serving, we need to find a way to communicate with those uh, people. So I think that was a very important point made. In terms of the project search model, that is something that I was aware of, but I will look closely into. I am quite sure that the Scottish uh, Consortium for, for Learning Disability will wish to be very closely involved in the rollout of uh, our uh, devolved uh, employment support services, particularly for disabled people. So I'm sure that they will wish to play a key uh, role in that process. Um, Mr. Brown um, raised a number of points, one of which I've already dealt with in my intervention, but on the issue of alignment of employability, of course, as we've heard in the debate, points made very well by uh, Gordon MacDonald and by Chuck Brody. Um, the point is at the moment that we are a bit hamstrung because the, 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 the jigsaw is fragmented. Some of the powers are here and some of the powers are at Westminster. That is a point that has been recognised uh, by indeed many uh, uh, third sector organisations quoted uh, this afternoon. I, I think I've already dealt with one intervention. I've got now a little time and I am trying to 
get round as many people as possible in terms of their important contributions today. So I think that uh, the, the, the fact of the fragmentation is indeed uh, holding us back and I think we could do an awful lot better if we had the powers as suggested to be devolved in the heads of agreement of the Smith Commission. I do hope that the member will support the devolution of those powers and not the more restrictive uh, powers that came up in the draft clauses. On the important issue raised by a number of members, including uh, Gavin Brown and including uh, Michael McMahon, on the issue of uh, uh, those with disabilities and having access to employment, of course, it is fair to say that the modern apprenticeship is one scheme, and there are other uh, areas, perhaps, where the reporting is not being picked up in terms of, of numbers. But it is fair to say that a lot of work still needs to be done, and that is why, as part of the national programme uh, uh, under the Developing Scotland Young Workforce uh, project, we have allocated uh, uh, some additional funding, part of a wider £3 million allocation in 2014-15, to develop a range of equality activity. One of those uh, activities is research, which is, I think, about to be completed. The, you know, there has been involvement of various stakeholders, and once we have that research, we'll be in a position to proceed with an action plan, a very brief intervention, because we did already have one. Thank a very you, brief point. I'll try to be helpful, uh, uh, Minister. It would be useful if we could get the figures on, on people in training uh, who have disabilities in the round so that we can have that proper contract, as I take the point that you're making. Minister. Yeah, yes, I do accept that point. I mean, I was going on to say to, to Dr uh, Simpson that, of course, in terms of uh, what he suggested of a breakdown of uh, what kinds of disability and so on, I think that is important. But it has been pointed out to me in my work, uh, along with both Michael McMahon and Siobhan McMahon on the cross-party group on disability and, indeed, in other areas, that for some people with a disability they don't self-identify so there is that issue to be borne in mind but I do nonetheless think that to the extent that we can we should try to gather more information to better equip ourselves to work out uh, a better uh, way forward um, also I would say in response to some of the other uh, some of the other uh, comments in the debate which I've now lost on this one uh, that um, Margaret McCulloch made a, a good point uh, to the effect that employability schemes do not work in isolation I entirely uh, agree with that. Stuart Maxwell uh, spoke about uh, in his constituency McKean uh, Development Limited in Barhead uh, being the 100th uh, firm accredited as a living wage accredited employer. I did indeed had the pleasure to meet with uh, them at a reception uh, in a barn Deniston uh, just on the day in which they were, received the accreditation and they were very uh, proud to have uh, uh, achieved that accreditation. Uh, Mark MacDonald mentioned um, the excellent uh, approach in terms of employability of the station house media unit, SHMU. I indeed had a very successful visit there and I was very uh, impressed with the excellent work uh, that they are doing. Colin Beatty mentioned the Invest in Young People accolade and I would encourage all members to uh, in, engage with local business, to encourage local business to consider uh, uh, becoming uh, accredited in terms of the Invest in Young People accolade. Elaine Murray looked at uh, various local issues uh, in terms of De Vries and Galloway. And of course, if there is good practice to learn about, then I hope that Dr Murray will uh, make that known to me. Uh, Nigel Don uh, made the key point of the need to secure uh, further economic growth in order to secure the better opportunities for young people that we all uh, wish to see. Lewis MacDonald talked about the uh, highlight of the important work of the Energy Jobs Task Force and of course the Scottish Government has been working closely with unions and will uh, continue to do so. Richard Lyle, well, what can I say, he made a passionate speech uh, uh, and he was very passionate indeed about the need for fair work which I think we can all agree with. Um, Stuart Stevenson uh, spoke about the overriding need to put uh, first the interests of people uh, in need of a bit of help into the world of work and that is the overriding approach that we have taken to today's debate. Uh, he also made a powerful plea for the need to treat people as individuals and not as categories, a point I entirely uh, agree with. Uh, Margaret McDougall stressed the important role of the third sector in employment support provision in Scotland, and that was a point uh, well made with her experience on the uh, CPG on volunteering. James Dornan talked about local examples in his constituency of Glasgow Cuthcart of young people getting the skills that they need to make their way into the world of work with help from local programmes such as The Only Way Is Up and I feel a wee visit probably coming on to Cuthcart. Uh, Mike Russell stepped into the breach to make a brief contribution to the debate and a very uh, interesting one it was too. He focused on the need to 
uh, tackled the issue of inequality in society and in this regard highlighted the important role that local jobs fairs can play. Presiding officer, uh, that Audrey, was, please. Can we hear the Minister closing? Uh, that was uh, an example of the, indeed the wide-ranging nature of the debate today. Uh, I see that I have only a little bit of time left, so that means that I won't be reading out this very long, detailed technical speech. I'm just going through the pages. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there are a, a number of important uh, points uh, that have emerged from today's debate. In terms of suggestions made, these suggestions will be uh, duly considered by the government uh, because that is the, the point of the exercise. We want a broad uh, discussion about how we can do this better because that is how we will serve better the people that are relying on us to act, uh, to act in a way that serves their interests and not gets uh, diverted down other routes. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I would just say that the government has established a strong track record in supporting people into work, uh, and we have heard evidence of that today. I am determined that we will seize the opportunity brought by the planned devolution of employment support services to build on that success and to ensure that more people secure better work and secure the benefits that this will bring to Scotland, to her people and to her communities. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes the debate on Scotland's future employability services. And it's time to move on to the next item of business, which is decision time. Could I ask members who are in the chamber and hoping to vote at decision time to check that their cards are properly in their consoles? Thank you very much. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 13023.1, in the name of Siobhan McMahon, which seeks to amend Motion No. 13023, in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, on Scotland's future employability services, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed, and therefore we will move to a vote. Members should please cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 13023.1 in the name of Siobhan McMahon is yes, 54, no, 13. There were no abstentions. The amendment, therefore, is agreed to. Which then brings us to the next question, which is that Motion 13023 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, as amended, on Scotland's future employability services, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed and therefore we will move to a vote. Members should please cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 13023 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham as amended is yes 57, no 9. There were two abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to and that concludes decision time. As we are now moving to members' business, I'd be grateful if members who are leaving the chamber could do so quietly, please.